we're live back on Facebook. So hello everybody there. And it is, let me do my screen share here. Uh, oops, I've got a mess on my screen. Sorry guys. Uh, we will get back to that in just a second. Bye-bye everybody. Here. Oh, and we're here. Okay, so we have another one or two sessions coming from our Center of Excellence partners, um, but we, we don't have time for that right now. We have very pressing matters to get to here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so you can't have HCM Awareness Day without Dr. Barry Marin. Like, how could that happen? Barry, you're on mute. So welcome, hey. Barry, to HCM Awareness Day. Good afternoon, Lisa. You're looking good. Thank you so much. I haven't seen you in a while. I, I feel like the longest I while. haven't. <laughs> I haven't seen you in a while. You're looking good. Thank you. I feel good. It, it's amazing what happens when you get blood circulating through your system with a normally exactly. functioning heart. Everybody should have a heart transplant well, at some point. You know, they are growing them in pigs and that wonderful patient down in Maryland is still doing well after six weeks after his pig heart transplant. So there mm -hmm. is hope for more availability and who knows, maybe it will become more common in the future. Yeah. But today, Barry, where do we start? Um, uh, can you see me? or I'm I can see you. I can see okay. you. Your camera's on, your audio's on. And I can't I, see myself. You can't hear. Well, we'll put you back up here for a little bit. There you are. So I'm going to okay. do, uh, as we start talking, we'll, we'll bring up the slides so we can kind of keep people along with some of the top topics that we're talking about. I want to go back in time though. Prior to the founding of the HCMA. That's impossible. This, it's been here forever. I know it feels like it. It truly feels like it. So I started today's session with explaining that, you know, the death of my sister in 1995 from mismanaged HCM led me on a bit of a quest. Um, it, was an, it was a crazy time. I was, just to bring everybody back a little bit with me, I was, oh God, when was I? I was 26 years old. I was eight months pregnant. And my sister dies suddenly. And four months prior to that, I told her if anything ever happened to her, I'd, I'd make sure I had the kids and her kids would be safe. So here we are, 26 years old, family history of HCM, lost multiple family members to HCM. My sister dies. I have kids to take care of. And I come up to the conclusion that I'm too busy to die. And I need to make sure that I stay alive. So I started to dig for data. And every article, which I couldn't find a lot of because access to the internet was limited, access to clinical publications were limited. But the name that I kept seeing was Barry Marin, Barry Marin, Barry Marin. So being typical me, I picked up the phone and I called Barry Marin directly. I'm like, hey, I need to talk to you. And I never expected a world famous cardiologist to pick up the phone and call me back in less than a half an hour. And he called me back and he said, who are you and what are you doing? I'm like, I want to start this support group thing for patients because there's nothing out there. What do you think? And this became my education by fax machine. Remember when that old fax paper that would be in rolls? Barry would send me articles through fax machines and said, read this, read this, read this. Never once did he give me the conclusion. He made me find it on my own. And in that he became the most amazing mentor and teacher I could possibly imagine. And I was very lucky to be able to have those conversations. That was 26 and a half years ago. That was before we formed an organization. <clears throat> it was a whole different world then. My original diagnosis was 1980. I was told you have HCM and there's literally nothing they can do for you. You could die suddenly and unexpectedly and that's it, you're gone. I lived through that. I lived through the death of my sister, my uncle, We'd already lost my aunt and my grandfather. And then I found Barry Marin. Barry, what's happened to HCM since my family found out about it, since Claude Brady was diagnosed, since you got in the game so many years ago? Where are we? Well, you're right. Uh, a lot has happened. Um, a real sea change, really. Um, 
this disease came out of the woodwork. Uh, it was once, as you mentioned, uh, considered uh, grim and uh, unfavorable and deadly and untreatable, largely. And, and now we have a completely different situation in, as you say, maybe uh, 25, 30 years only, where uh, HCM is relative, known to be relatively common. It was previously thought to be extraordinarily rare, but it's relatively common. It is highly treatable and uh, it provides uh, these, these treatments that we've been talking about provide a good quality of life and extended longevity. Uh, this is a completely different disease than it was back then, obviously. And uh, I think that, you know, the purpose of getting up here today is to, one of which is to make that point that uh, things have changed. It's, it seems interestingly to be ignored sometimes. People get locked into the old ideas of what the disease is that they heard about in med school and residency. Um, and it's hard for a lot of people to, to make that conversion to what is now a contemporary disease that uh, is, as I said, highly treatable. So there's an information gap to some extent even among cardiologists who uh, uh, should know better. And there are uh, treatment algorithms that are, uh, are not experimental. They're, they're, they're part of modern cardiologic care. As you uh, alluded, the uh, implantable defibrillator, which would have saved your relative many years ago, and has saved uh, thousands of patients with HCM. It definitely has. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I, I want to ask you a couple of pointed questions and kind of del delve into different parts of conversation here. So we know that we've evolved. My transplant is an obvious connection to all of that. We were able to manage it all the way to the end and, and beyond. But what is the new outcome HCM outcome data look like? What are we, what is this disease now? Well, I, I think that's well documented. Um, this is what we've been uh, working on uh, for the last 10, 15 years uh, to describe the outcome, the expectations that patients can have with that diagnosis. Uh, in a, another era of cardiology. So our mortality data, if I may speak about mortality due to HCM for a moment, uh, back a ways was 6% per year. You have to go back 30 years or so for that. Uh, that was before the implantable defibrillator and, and the high quality uh, myectomy, et cetera. But uh, that was a number that, was, that the disease was characterized as. And of course, led to this idea that it was grim and unrelenting. 6% per year pretty much extinguishes the patient population by the time they're age 50. So, uh, you know, uh, what we've done is to bring in the available modern treatments and lower the mortality rate from, let's say, 6% to what it is uh, in a HCM referral center practicing uh, in the way I'm speaking to 0.5%, 0.5%. So that's many fold different than 6%, obviously. It turns out that there's another issue here that is very difficult for a lot of people to accept that, that if you take that 0.5% of treated HCM, may require prophylactic treatments with implantable defibrillators, and um, that 0.5% annually is less than virtually any other risk, cardiac or non cardiac, to living. So, you know, when, when I started this thing um, back a ways, 
Uh, if you listed the diseases and risks to living uh, in order, um, HCM would have been considered somewhere near the top, somewhere near forms of cancer are now. Um, and uh, now it's at the bottom. Now that's a very hard thing for uh, a lot of people to accept that change. It seems very dramatic, but there are reasons behind it. It's not a game. Um, you know, and a lot of investigators, cardiologists, are for some reason invested in the idea that it must not be so low. How could that be? That HCM now is at the bottom. No, well, I think uh, expert care makes all the difference there. It's at the bottom when you have the expert well, care. Even some of our experts find that difficult to accept. That'll give you in certain parts of the world, for example. So, you know, it's, there are a lot of reasons for that, but, you know, it, it, sometimes it's difficult, apparently, for people to accept the reality when it's very good. Instead of trying to accept reality as very bad, uh, this is the opposite, it turns the world on its head. So uh, that 0.5% is real. Uh, so just uh, to be clear, for some people who are listening that aren't following the statistics here, we were saying that 30, 35 years ago, within the HCM community, 6% of patients a year were dying from some form of heart failure, arrhythmia, <clears throat> death. But now, yeah. annually, of the HCM community, when treated at a high volume center, the death rate is closer to 0.5% per year. Yeah, that's 12 fold. You know. That's amazing. Well, it is it amazing, is. but there are a lot of things in cardiology that are likely, you know? Um, and a lot of the treatments that are not particularly relevant to HCM have had similar changes in other cardiovascular conditions. It just seems like there's something about HCM that that doesn't comp compute to for people. You know, that may work for coronary disease, heart attacks, uh, what have you. But it is, it seems ingrained, that 6% or whatever, seems ingrained for HCM, that it, it couldn't possibly change. That's it's a psychological, and that's one of our, uh, uh, you know, efforts is to convey that information. We, we believe that we can only do that by repeatedly making that point based on hard data. So let's take a pivot here. So we know that it is a contemporary treatable disease. We've been talking about that for a number of years within our little community. But what causes HCM to begin with? Can we talk about families with HCM and what we know and what we don't know? Well, the basic cause of HCM remarkably is not firmly known, basic cause for the overall disease. This is clearly a condition that can be familial and transmitted as an autosomal dominant trait meaning that in each consecutive generation, about half the relatives have an opportunity to have, be affected by HCM. Uh, that is an observation that's 60 years old. It's, there's no question about it. But it, and the idea that therefore HCM is a uniformly speaking, a genetic disease has, has followed that. But it doesn't appear to be fair. It's a disease that can be, maybe frequently can be, <clears throat> genetic and familial. Um, but there are um, many instances within the population that don't conform to, the, to this genetic model. A lot of people are not aware that if you did genetic testing in 100 consecutive patients with established disease, with imaging. 
what percentage do you think, let's say, would have evidence of a genetic disease by genetic testing? In other words, identification of pathogenic sarcomere protein mutations. I know the answer, but I'm going to think most people would think it's most of them, but it's the opposite. It's only about 30 to 40 percent. No, it's 30 percent, period. There, there's a literature. There are you know, hundreds and hundreds of patients in studies to answer this question, and the number is no more than 30 percent. Okay. So what are the rest? Well, it's multifactorial. I mean, we, we, you know, this is an area of, of uncertainty, uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of uncertainty about this, um, but there is non-genetic, non-familial, what appears to be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, one of the clinical, um, you know, inferences for that is that, you know, I, because of 30 five years of this genetic model being conveyed to patients that, that HCM is a genetic disease. Um, and we've written that hundreds of times ourselves. It said that this was a you know, relatively common genetic disease. And that has conveyed a burden, I think, to some families who believe that, uh, you know, psychologically speaking, if not demonstrable that they have conveyed the disease to their children or have the potential to do so, or that it's highly likely that they will or have. So it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's sort of a change in the way we think about the disease. And I, uh, I think, you know, we need to do family screening. That is, uh, my comments are not intended to, to diminish family screening because HDM is not infrequently genetic and transmissible to the next generation. But that's not the same thing as HCM, 30% on genetic testing or genetics, uh, is a, by definition, uniformly a genetic disease. It's a difference. So because for that 30% that we can find a pathogenic mutation, screen the families for those pathogenic mutations of what we know today, that's one pathway. But for the rest of them, cascade family screening with echo EKG, checkup with cardiologist annually from puberty through full development, and then every three to five years thereafter, that's what we do because that's what we know to do right now. But as we evolve in our understanding, maybe that will change. Okay. Am I on the right yeah. path there? Well, yes. I mean, this is an area of uh, award-winning research in the future. Uh, difficult. Uh, we're, we're, we're into this, okay? Uh, but the non-genetic form of HCM is going to be harder to, to define than the genetic one. And, um, but is, is uh, you know, a source of, of, of a lot of interest and uh, energy. So we're still evolving in our knowledge of where it all comes from. And this is where we need to go next. But I wanna take a look back at a couple pivotal items that you brought to the forefront. And I'm gonna show a couple of slides as we talk about this. And that's sudden death prevention. You know, when I did my original search for HCM and Barry Marin's name kept popping up, it was always tied to this sudden death and sudden death in athletes. That's where we're seeing a lot of publications in the 90s on you. Um, but we've moved. We, we have changed that narrative by diagnosis and management with something that Michelle Morosky helped create all those years ago. And you were there for those early days, too. So what do we know about sudden death and risk prevention? And I'm gonna show a slide from the, the documents that were just published recently. So let's talk about sudden death. I'm gonna jump over to this. So we have this, the, the risk stratification um, algorithm here. Do you wanna, are you well, seeing that I mean, on your? 
there are two things uh, that are part of this idea of prevention of sudden death, leading to very rare occurrence, much rarer occurrences of sudden death in evaluated patients. The first is a matured uh, risk stratification. There, uh, you know, I don't want to get into all the, the details. I want to hit the high points that, that uh, we worked on this intensively and added risk markers that, uh, you know, um, can be the basis for implants. And I, I don't want to go any farther on this without mentioning uh, the investigators that have uh, done the most in this area. Uh, I'm not taking credit for the whole thing by any means. Um, and Marty uh, uh, has um, uh, you know, moved this field forward measurably. And also uh, Ethan Rowan working with us um, has um, uh, contributed substantially. Um, we, uh, for example, uh, we've added risk markers like the left ventricular apical aneurysm which is a very powerful risk marker that will lead to prophylactic implants and uh, prevention of sudden death. So there's the risk stratification algorithm that tells you which patients are most deserving of a uh, plantable device. And then of course, it's all dependent on the device, um, uh, which is uh, uh, very powerful and reliable in uh, terminating lethal ventricular tachyarrhythmias in HCM patients. It was, the device was not designed initially for this disease, obviously. You mentioned Michelle Murawski. And, and when Murawski and Maurer built the ICD for the first time, they were of course focused on ischemic heart disease. And the ICD was developed, of course, in the context of ischemic heart disease. Um, a little more than 20 years ago, I, I mean, I will take credit for uh, bringing the ICD to HCM in year 2000. Um, and that was taking the instrument. We, we didn't make it or do anything to it, but take the implantable defibrillator, which was the uh, vision of Michelle Murawski and applied it to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, we didn't really know whether it would work, uh, at least reliably, in a disease that was characterized by left ventricular hypertrophy, alpha tract obstruction, ischemia, etc., diastolic dysfunction, different than ischemic heart disease. But it turned out uh, by, uh, in part, luck that the ICD is as or more reliable in HCM than it is in coronary artery disease. And because of that, uh, hundreds if not thousands of patients with this disease are alive today who would otherwise be dead. It, it has prevented sudden death. Uh, it, our data uh, would show that there are, of patients evaluated in centers that are oriented to prevention of sudden death, that um, very few people or patients with HCM will die suddenly of HCM in that setting. Uh, these sudden deaths will occur in the community probably not at a particularly high uh, frequency, but they will continue because uh, the athletes, for example, uh, or others uh, who are not evaluated for HCM or diagnosed even with it, uh, uh, would not have the opportunity to be implanted. So we, we, we haven't and probably can never extinguish sudden death in this disease, but I think we've, uh, almost certainly uh, substantially diminished it and its impact on the patient population. Because uh, when we started, as you suggested, it was uh, the idea of sudden death was 
you know, a source of enormous anxiety for patients, as, as you would imagine. Uh, there was nothing to be done, and they were at risk for sudden death. What, you know, what is that all about in, in modern terms? It was not very so, fun to live through that time, I just have to tell you. No, absolutely not. Uh, but that doesn't have to be the case now. And isn't Not at all. It isn't the case. And I, I want to highlight a couple of items because I think you brought up some excellent points as, as expected. Um, so we're better at doing risk stratification. We have more tools in the risk stratification toolbox. We're not perfect. We don't know it all yet. And even in the best situations, sometimes HCM wants to be tricky and the first symptom can be quite disastrous with no risk factors, but that is incredibly rare today. I would say- yeah, I'm, I'm gonna make a point right here. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but- Oh no, please. Um, you said something a second ago that uh, something along the lines that it's not perfect, you know, risk gratification uh, in HCM. And it's, it's not, uh, there's no such thing as per perfect risk gratification one-to-one. -one. These diseases, are much too complicated for that clinically. Uh, certainly HCM, highly heterogeneous and, and all of that, but you, you know, coronary disease, anything else, uh, you would imagine the, the, the risk stratification is never permanent. But I've been impressed by one thing that, uh, and even in the literature, that there are naysayers that hold HCM risk stratification to a higher burden as if it should be perfect. When in fact, there are patients with uh, coronary disease that are implanted uh, are, are not uh, in, in anything remotely close to that situation. Um, I think uh, the um, ability to identify high-risk patients with HCM is extremely high and, and exceeds that of uh, coronary disease or dilated cardiomyopathy or anything else. It exceeds it. Um, it's close to where it should be. But we always see people want to wanna have their say, you know, it's not uh, there are gaps or it's not perfect or anything. Uh, of course it isn't. But I think it's pretty close to where you would want to be in a heterogeneous disease like this if you could try to be. So, um, uh, you know, I think if somebody wants to criticize risk stratification, they ought to go to, you know, older patients with coronary disease that are implanted uh, after big heart attacks who are at risk for uh, ventricular tachyarrhythmias. So, I would also say, you know, that our approach to risk stratification is based on really the old fashioned idea of individual major markers, like uh, really thick hearts or family history of sudden death or syncope. Uh, the classic risk markers that everybody agrees about. But we do not favor, with good reason, uh, identifying patients for ICDs based on the European approach, which is quantitative uh, risk scoring, because we have shown that to be insensitive and undoubtedly would leave some patients um, uh, unprotected because they would not have devices and probably deserve to have them. So there is more than one way to do it. Um, if you're in Europe, you, you reflexly prefer the uh, ESC risk score for some reason. And if you're here, uh, I think most American cardiologists understand the uh, individual risk marker approach. One or more uh, important markers could be enough to consider at least an implantable defibrillator in a given patient. That is 
really incredible that in 35 years, we've gotten to this point of being able to identify these risk factors very well, not perfectly, but very well, and give people the opportunity to participate in shared decision-making to get an ICD and potentially save their lives. It's, it's technology and, and availability of knowledge that helped this mother sleep at night when her, her daughter was viewed to be at a higher risk. So I, I've lived it myself. I've, I've been there for my family members, my, my niece, my nephew, my daughter, everybody. So um, I appreciate the technology and I appreciate the science and the work that went into developing that. Let's pivot to another part of HCM and that is obstruction. And why is it important? And this is again from the paper in Jack, um, which the link will be dropped in um, to our communications methods here. Um, so can you talk a little bit about obstruction? Is it reversible heart failure? Is it myectomy only? What are we doing now with obstruction? Well, no, it's about heart failure and it's about the power to reverse heart failure. Uh, when you go home tonight and turn on the TV and there's a commercial about Entrestor, in patients with congestive heart failure, not HCM, they're going to imply something about reversibility or other words used to suggest also that patients will live longer because of the drug. Um, you know, it's very hard to reverse congestive heart failure. But it turns out that that idea is not new to HCM. The, uh, because most of heart failure in HCM is due to obstruction, the blood flow out of the left side of the heart, outflow tract obstruction. And we have had and continue to have over 60 years methods to um, obliterate that obstruction, that, that gradient across the outflow tract. Um, it's nothing new, but for example, a surgical myectomy um, is an operation that uh, survives because it is for 60 years, because it is capable of reversing uh, obstruction by obliterating the outflow gradient permanently. Can't beat that, can you? It's a permanent relief of obstruction and therefore makes it almost impossible to develop the heart failure that, that the patients had before because that heart failure was due to obstruction. Uh, I think a lot of people, I don't know who to name, have trouble with that idea that this is reversible heart failure. In other words, uh, most of our patients, and again, operated on by a, an experienced surgeon with this operation, will evolve from disability, so-called New York Heart Class Three, to asymptomatic. It's, it's, so, it's so dramatic that you sometimes have difficulty accepting it. And it's not occasional. 95% uh, of patients with the myectomy will achieve substantial improvement in their quality of life, including 70% who are returned to normal, normal activity. So if you're not familiar with myectomy in your practice, let's say, uh, this kind of idea is going to be lost to you. And there is a gap in information there. Uh, true reversibility of heart failure occurs uh, as a matter of fact in HCM. Pretty amazing. Well, it is. I think uh, all these things are kind of amazing. Um, that's probably part of the problem because they're so dramatic clinically 
that they're, are, they're difficult to accept. And then naysayers and skeptics. But the data there, this is not an opinion. So we're moving into a new day. Things are coming. And I'm going to jump to this. And that is myosin inhibitors. So we talked about obstruction. We talked about sudden death risk. Um, but what about a myosin inhibitor? What, what, are the, what do you think is going to happen when they start to hit? much larger patient populations and we can look at long-term data. What's happening? What do you think? Well, is you know, one of the other characteristics of HCM is when there's something new, gets everybody very excited and that is understandable and legitimate. But um, like everything else, you know, alcohol ablation, for example, I, you know, one has to really look at the disease and what the real situation is. Um, we've had negative inotropes before, for more than 30 years. It's called uh, disapyramide. Disapyramide has the same actions as mavocamp. Uh, negative inotropic agents reduce obstruction. They, that, that is what they do. Um, and the myosin inhibitors of which mavocampin is only one, there's going to probably be a you know, series of them, are negative inotropes and they will reduce obstruction. So that's good. There is going to be a, a use of drugs like we have used isopyramide and it is still available uh, to um, reduce obstruction, which would reduce symptoms in patients that are becoming operative candidates. That's been going on a long time. So this is actually nothing really new. What's new about it is that it is supported by big pharma, which has never had a hand in HCM before. So you can get an exaggeration of what is a good thing, okay? And the, the, the problematic implication is that this is some kind of magic drug that will wipe away this grim and untreatable disease again. And a lot of people that don't know the disease and a lot of people that you know, live on total optimism will um, potentially be, uh, you know, uh, uh, misunderstanding of the value of a myosin inhibitor. So I think they're going to be useful in some patients, but there is absolutely no evidence of how long they will act, just as a case with disapyramide. So, um, uh, you know, going to, patients going to be improved somewhat with symptoms for a few uh, weeks or months. It doesn't eliminate the, the necessity of having surgical myectomy there because that's the only definitive way of uh, eliminating obstruction and eliminating heart failure symptoms that are caused by obstruction. Uh, it'll take years. You know, our concern is that um, the, um, the value of um, Mavicampton will be misunderstood by the practicing community. And that patients who should have surgery to reverse heart failure and restore normal life will be, uh, you know, treated with a, uh, a drug longer than they should be and will then miss out on the opportunities presented by uh, myectomy, surgery. So um, we're not anti-Navicampton at all. 
but we, um, in a way, are pro-surgery and uh, also pro-prudence. Uh, so I'm going to throw in a couple of thoughts here. <clears throat> and it makes me feel a little bit older than I want to feel when I have to say this, but when we met, there was a controversy brewing in HCM, which I thought was going to be unusual, but it seems to keep happening. We have different controversies. And that first controversy was dual chamber pacemakers. And it was going to be the panacea. It was going to fix everybody's problems, hook them up. It even made an episode. Oh my God, what show was it? Chicago Hope. I remember there was a character who came to the emergency room. They diagnosed her with HCM. They gave her a dual chamber pacemaker, told her she'd be fine and live her life. Aye. And then alcohol septoablation showed up. And that was going to be the answer for everybody. And that didn't quite work out. Rich Bach and I were talking about this this morning. And I, I see people kind of maybe jumping onto a new drug with much the same, as I believe Rick Nishimura put it well back then, unbridled enthusiasm. But in reality, everything has a place. And we have to find the right places for the right patients at the right time. And all of these tools have use but we have to be cautious about how we use them until we know them better. Would you agree with my assessment of unbridled enthusiasm in the history of HCM? Yeah, I mean, we're saying the same thing. I, I said that before, that uh, when something new comes, uh, it, uh, it takes uh, force because part of it's because of what HCM is. It's relatively uncommon compared to coronary disease practiced only in a few places at a high level. And uh, it's sitting there uh, susceptible for this kind of unbridled enthusiasm, a term that I also used with Rick, uh, with alcohol ablation, pacing, you know. They come and they go. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, it's the same issue with new drugs right? of some value. Now, of course, uh, it doesn't mean that they come and they go and they are never seen before. Alcohol ablation is a accepted uh, alternative selectively for non-surgical patients, okay? Pacing is gone, yes, that's true. Uh, new drugs will be with us, and eventually uh, the unbridled enthusiasm will be modified. But that's not the same thing as saying that it isn't good to have more things for patients. It's been 40 years since we had any drugs for this disease. That goes back to disapyramide and So uh, it's hard to argue that this could be of some value, but it has to be put in perspective. And it never is at the beginning in HCM, particularly when, um, you know, one company pays $13 billion for the rights to market the, the drug, because that's never happened before. We are in new times. There are bigger players at the table than ever before. And that's why I'm, I'm, we're doing things like today to raise awareness, to bring everybody to the understanding of where we are today. And there are a lot of people who are pinning their hopes on new therapeutics. Um, there are people who might have unrealistic expectations on what to expect. And I'm desperately trying to balance expectations from everybody. I think I've probably said this line more in the past two years than ever before in my life. HCM is complicated. It's not just the obstruction, it's the muscle, it's the arrhythmias, it's the confluence of all of it. And we don't really know a lot yet, but we're learning and we're doing the clinical trials and we're trying to throw more tools in the toolbox. And that's going to be an interesting road to travel with so many people. So Barry, we're heading towards closing of an hour, which 
you said, oh, we'll do this in 20 minutes. I'm like, I'm going to give you an hour. We're going to talk for an hour. So we're, we're approaching that. I want to talk about the future. We've talked a lot about the past. We know that pharma's here and there's new drugs coming, not just from one, but from multiple companies. We're even talking about genetic therapies potentially in the not too distant future. What do you think patients can expect in the, the differences that are going to come in diagnostic and therapeutic and management issues? Look, Lisa, there's always going to be new things and that's always good, okay? But I want to depart a little bit from talking about the future. You said that everybody is pinning their hopes on new things. And I just told you that we have a mortality rate of, you know, approaching zero in what well, certainly is zero in certain subgroups of patients. Uh, high quality of life with certain uh, treatments such as the relief of obstruction and reversibility of heart failure. Virtual abolition of fatal uh, embolic stroke with uh, modern anticoagulation. So it kind of, I must say, bothers me to hear about pinning hopes on new stuff. That is backward. We have reached a very high level of therapy for a complicated disease thought impossible 30 years ago. And it's, when you say, Finding hopes on new treatments is like you're throwing that away and looking for something. What? What are you looking for? I hope you're not looking for gene therapy. Well, which is a preposterous idea in this disease. Okay? But sounds good, might even generate some grant support, might give some some something to write about more papers, difficult to understand about genetics, but there is no pathway forward for gene editing, gene therapy above and beyond where we are now. Now, if somebody comes along with something that uh, uh, you know eliminates all these risks and makes all these therapies that we've been developing uh, you know, unnecessary, then good for them. All right. They're trying. They're trying. But, so I, I, want, but, I want to pause for a it's, second. It's, but, but it's mm -hmm. deceptive to patients. It's like HCM is still grim and unrelenting and gene therapy, gene editing, whatever, is going to, to be the thing and completely skipping over dramatic, as you, you've conceded, dramatic changes in treatment and management. So when I think about the future, I think about this first. Now there are parts of this diverse disease spectrum that require something new, not the whole disease, necessarily, but some, you know, what about the patients who develop progressive heart failure in the absence of obstruction and, and become candidates for transplant, okay? That's not our favorite treatment for these patients. Uh, what we're interested in doing is trying to find a way to um, mitigate the pathophysiology of that uh, progression, which is fibrosis excessive scarring of the heart due to God knows what, leading patients in a direction where nobody really wants to go, okay? Uh, yeah, uh, the future should target certain subgroups of patients with something novel to actually change the disease at a fundamental level but we don't need some pie in the sky genetic 
uh, treatment for the whole disease. So that's my answer to the future. So I will say, this is where I love having conversations with Barry because we look at the world slightly differently. Um, mortality rates are improved. Quality of life is improved for many, but there are still a great number of patients who are suffering with symptoms that they do not feel are adequately addressed to give them the quality of life that they would like to have return. Some of them, uh, you'll hear a story later if you stay around for the rest of the session, the patient that we featured in HCM Academy, who Joseph, he actually um, did have a myectomy and he was, it was doom and gloom up until then and he's really doing great right now. But other patients who have had longstanding issues and have had a myectomy and still aren't feeling great, we need more for them. We need more for people whose quality of life is not 100%. And we may not ever get them to 100, but if they're living at 70, they'd sure like to get back to 90. And those therapies still have value and discovery is still needed to get the, those individuals the quality of life that they want and need and deserve, as well as the safety of, of feeling that they're, they're secure in their life. They have predictable days and they can move on with life with HCM, not constantly living, thinking about it. Can I climb those stairs? Can I do this? I agree with you that septal reduction therapies, primarily myectomy, provide so much support and, and benefit to patients. I've witnessed thousands over 25 years. It's amazing. Drug therapy, Norpay's long acting would be great for a lot of patients if it were readily available on a consistent basis, but five outages in five years is not good. So we need to make sure that we not only have good drugs and good therapies, but the drugs that we have are quality drugs and we know where they're coming from. So there's a lot of other issues we need to advocate for and we need to continue pushing forward on. Things will change. People are paying attention to HCM now. I'm not always gonna think their ideas are perfect, but they're going to keep happening. So we hope that patients stay safe and that patients have a role in the decision-making as to what therapies that they're really looking to be developed. And we're working with some partners on making sure the patient voice is front and center, but we need great scientists. And in today's world, having clinicians who have the time to be great scientists too, it's a little challenging. It's a funding issue, it's a time issue. So we need to be there to help support those initiatives moving forward. And I think we can definitely agree that things are a lot better now than they were 40 years ago. And I think they stand to be much improved in the next 10, 15 years. Can we agree on that? Yeah, you, you asked me to talk about the disease. Mm -hmm. And I can't, I, you know, I, I can't do that by talking about individual patients. We're, we're obviously very sensitive to patients who do not achieve the benefit from any of these therapies that we uh, wish. Uh, they, they are a minority, but that doesn't mean that they aren't very important. And they are your clients. But I, my, my job was to talk about the disease. And, um, and I also said at the beginning that for sure, uh, you know, we always want to get better, you know, but we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that uh, is a dangerous thing for patients who could benefit but are, are not um, uh, given the opportunity because there's some uh, uncertainty about what the management of this disease should be now. Agreed. Barry, you have done extraordinary things with your one wild and precious life. And we appreciate you more than maybe you know. Um, I love your fire. I love your willingness to debate and to ask tough questions and make tough statements. <clears throat> I don't think the HCM world would be anywhere near where they are if you hadn't decided that this was a disease you wanted to care about and spend your career on. So I miss seeing you at the annual meetings that we used to have all the time and catching up once a year and having that opportunity and getting you in front of the patients for them to tell you directly in a group <clears throat> how much they appreciate you. 
So it's been a wild ride. It's not done yet. We've got more to do. And um, I expect great things to happen in the near future. And I'm sure we'll be back to talk about some of them. Good. Let's not forget the past, though. We're never going to forget the past. And Barry, thank you for participating in our first ever HCM Awareness Day. And we'll see you back hopefully next year with some newer updates. Okay. Thank you, Barry. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Lisa needs a drink of water. I've been going like how many hours now? Okay, Facebook. Okay, questions. We're about to pivot in the next five minutes um, to bring in cytokinetics to talk about future therapies. And I don't know, I've kind of talked about them a couple of times today and there might be some stuff coming up here. So I do want to just take a couple of minutes to go over, <clears throat> excuse me, go over the question box. So obviously um, it's really hard to keep track of all of this. And Barry was here to give a talk, not necessarily do a Q&A. So some of you who asked specific questions, I'm sorry, we did not have an opportunity to answer them. Um, we could potentially um, do more. Um, Harry Lever, you're in the audience. Um, if you want to stick with us a little bit, I, I would love to have you come talk about that live. Um, if you want to communicate in the chat box mm -hmm. with uh, Julie or Elena and see if you want to come live for about a three minute segment when we can talk about the quality of drugs, um, maybe a little bit later on as we have a little bit of a break, um, just let us know what time would work for you. We'll bring you on to have that conversation. Sorry, I should have done that in advance. Forgot about it. Um, we have a lot planned for a day. Okay, so answering the questions, I'm just going to answer them live right now, even though I really did not answer them. I would encourage each of you who posted these very specific questions to contact the office. We'll help you figure out the right approach to addressing those questions and moving forward and getting you the answers that you need. Okay, so, um, and Kimmy, you asked a question that I clicked on a wrong button um, and the answer is no. You only do a myectomy for those with obstruction. You do not do it for the non-obstructed population. All right. So I did see Steve Heitner pop in there. So if Steve is here, okay. And Fatty is here. Okay. Our cytokinetics crew is here and we can stay five minutes ahead of schedule. That doesn't happen. And then we can find those five minutes for Dr. Lever to come on and speak to us later, hopefully. Um, so if my team wants to bring on... Oh, we got Harry right now. Daddy, yeah, no. hold on one second. Let I me just, talk to I, Harry. I for... can do it at five if you want, because I got okay. another call coming. Would that work? Um, we can try. Try me back okay. at five. Okay. All right. Thanks, All right. Harry. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Daddy's here. Steve is here. Okay. So we popped him out. Um, and Stacy and Elena, could you turn up the air conditioning now? It's happening. It's 60 <laughs> degrees out today. And Lisa has a jacket on and I'm not taking it off. So. Welcome Cytokinetics to the first ever HCM Awareness Day. Um, Steve, you left the center of excellence world. You moved into the other side in pharma, but we're still friends. So this is good. And Cytokinetics has been barred from stealing any more center of excellence directors for its programming. They have now taken two of them. I told Robert, no more. We've trained them up enough. So welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. So we have some exciting stuff to talk about. And a couple of people have set out some teasers in our morning or our early afternoon sessions about something that you guys have going on. So um, who wants to take the lead and who wants to screen share? Well, I can, uh, we don't have any prepared slides or okay. anything, but, but I thought you were. Um, no, but we can go ahead and, and give you a sense of what we're, um, what we're doing and um, and saw Steve to comment as well. So, you know, I think Lisa and to the audience, um, we've worked many, many years in, in developing modulators of skeletal and cardiac muscle function. And um, <clears throat> we're, we're sort of pleased to be able to turn all those efforts to um, developing a um, potential medicine that may be of use in, in HCM. Um, and, and maybe Steve will speak a little bit in terms of how we are 
uh, just announced today the opening of a clinical trial that is a phase three clinical trial for what a good day to do something like that. It's, what timing, right? It's all about timing. So who'd have thought? Um, but you know, cytokinetics has been committed to to heart disease for a long time, and it's um, it's an area um, of um, a lot of um, depth and. Uh, investment for the company in terms of our interaction with patients and with advocacy groups like yours and with um, the community at large. Um, it, it's been a long journey, you know, now 20 years of, of effort in terms of trying to pioneer and innovate in this area. Um, and, um, um, you know, recently we've now, um, I think, reached a point where our our potential medicines are in late stage development. The um, patients certainly are, are, we're engaged them in terms of thinking about how our clinical trials might be designed and executed and trying to be patient friendly in that regard because I know it's a burden, you know, to, to uh, participate in a clinical trial. So how, how can we sort of thread the needle in terms of ensuring, you know, we can understand uh, how to best develop information for uh, these new medicines. Um, the, um, so we're excited and we're excited um, to be just embarking now on the phase three trial for an HCM medicine. Uh, we'll, we'll have, uh, we had a press release out this morning that um, people want to go to cytokinetics.com can help. Oh, we already uh, linked it. Details it's of that. It's we're linked. linked. Right. You're all over it. It. Excellent. Um, but Steve Heitner joined us, as you said, a couple of years ago to help us uh, develop um, and, and move forward in this area. And he's uh, uh, now assumed a role that uh, I probably held for many years before he got here and, and is now our, our lead cardiovascular um, um, area uh, leader. So uh, maybe I'll ask Steve to talk a little bit about what we're doing in HCM and, and, uh, and Sequoia itself. Uh, cool. Thanks, Fatty. Um, uh, so, you, you know, as Fatty said, uh, I'm, I'm the therapeutic area lead for cardiovascular at Cytokinetics. Fatty had been doing that for several years. If I had any hair left, it probably would be gray already, <laughs> uh, just like his. Um, and uh, I've been at Cytokinetics for, for two years, uh, and it's been, uh, you know, everything that I had dreamed of uh, about coming to, as Lisa um, pointed out the dark side. Uh, I didn't really see it that way when I joined Cytokinetics at all. Um, really, the way that I, I viewed it is, you know, it would give me uh, even more of an opportunity to bring um, these important ther potential therapies, you know, to, to patients who have been treating for so many years um, in our center of excellence in Oregon. Um, do you want to say something, Lisa? No, I'm sorry. I, I'm 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 setting up the next talk and making sure, and I'm listening. So I'm ah, sorry okay, for the multitasking. Um, I'm not used to being a TV producer all day long, so <laughs> you got to give the girl a little bit of room here. I'll give okay. you a producer and commentator and interview. Producer, I, I'm like, but I have the whole team behind me. If it were if they weren't behind me, I would fall. So <laughs> go ahead, Steve. Yeah. I'm so sorry. So I, I actually, um, I'm glad that I interrupted your producing because I also wanted to, you know, bring you into the picture over here a little bit and just, um, you know, mention that when we met about 10 years ago, um, uh, when we were trying to get our center of excellence, I know it seems like a long time ago, uh, center of excellence up and running in, in Portland and Oregon, you know, Lisa came out and she viewed the facilities and she met all the necessary people. Um, and that was before, you had your new lease on life, actually. And I remember uh, walking through the hallway and you kind of pulling on my sleeve and saying, listen, buddy, slow down. This ticker is not, uh, <laughs> is not, is not as, as healthy as, uh, as, as I've seen. Um, yeah, that, that, that was not fun. Site visits were always a challenge. Travel, flight, walking the distance. And people are like, how you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm great. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm good. Yeah. Life with HCM. All my all my HCM people know that fake it till you make it moment. Well, um, you know the good news is, uh, and there's always kind of uh, a good uh, some good news is we, we did our first patient uh, forum uh, with you on site, um, and you helped kind of 
uh, lead that aspect of what we were trying to do. And then the second patient forum that we, we ran uh, was just after you had been hospitalized and you were waiting for your um, your transplant. I don't know if you remember that, but- uh, I do. Oh, that was not good. I was so sad. I wanted to come see you. You were amazing, actually. So, um, you know, don't be too hard on, on yourself. You were sitting there with a central line uh, in and you were getting your, your inotrope infusion um, to kind of augment your, your, your cardiac output. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you were a tremendous kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, role model for a lot of patients who were uh, fearful of what lay ahead for them. And now look at you, uh, prancing around the country, drumming up support and, and moving the needle um, from a patient advocacy standpoint. So, you know, uh, from my perspective, it's been a tremendous journey with you. Um, I'm very grateful for everything that you've done so far. Um, and then from the cytokinetics st standpoint, um, we're also very happy and excited to be partnering with the HCMA on multiple levels um, as we help try and bring these new, new potential therapies uh, forward. So, um, you know, with that, maybe I'll just talk a little bit about cy uh, cytokinetics uh, phase three study. Um, I think everybody's still... been kind of waiting all day to hear about that. <laughs> so tell them about Sequoia. Well, it builds on Redwood. So you'll notice that there's a little bit of a theme going down over here. So Redwood HCM was our phase two study and Sequoia um, basically takes the learnings from Redwood, which basically showed um, that our, our molecule afficamptin seems to be um, self, safe and well tolerated in uh, treating patients with obstructive HCM. Uh, and also, um, uh, helped us identify the doses that we need to use in the phase three study that uh, were shown to effectively reduce the degree of obstruction in, in many patients. Um, and we're hoping that that will translate into uh, what we're looking at in the phase three study, that, that that will translate into an improvement in exercise capacity and a reduction in overall symptom burden for patients suffering with um, persistent symptoms in the setting of obstructive HCM. Um, go ahead. So take us through a little bit of a walk. Some of the people that are watching are pharma, a lot of them aren't. What's a phase three trial? What does that mean? How many people do you need to do? How long are you following up? Give them a little context of what the trial is. Sure. So um, the phase two study, is dose finding and defining the safety um, profile of the drug. The phase three study is where we uh, look at the effectiveness of the drug and we do it in um, a randomized and blinded fashion. So that means that you know, the, the patients who participate in the study uh, will end up with a 50% chance of being assigned to either the active drug or a placebo uh, and nobody knows what you're on. The, the, the doctor treating you, the person running the trial, uh, and even the patient won't know what they're on definitely uh, because the placebo and the active drug look exactly the same. And over a course of about six months, patients will come into the hospital initially uh, quite frequently in the beginning uh, where we'll adjust the dose of the drug to meet the requirements of that individual patient. So each person may end up on a slightly different dose. Um, and that's because we want to give the individual patients uh, just enough of afficamptin, uh, but not necessarily too much. Um, so that dose, we call it the dose titration period where we're adjusting the dose. It happens over the first uh, six to eight weeks. Um, and then we follow people over the course of the period uh, of the study. And at the end of um, the six month period, we repeat an exercise test. So we compare the beginning exercise test to the final exercise test. And the thinking is that if you are on Afficamptin, we're hoping that we will see a, um, a tremendous improvement in exercise capacity and a reduction in symptoms compared to the placebo. Um, so that's a phase three study, and that's done under the kind of 
guidance of the FDA and of the discussions that we've had with them on the, um, the applicability and the, the quality of the study uh, with the hope that if we demonstrate this, this improvement, we can eventually go to FDA and submit the, the study and its results um, as part of a, a new drug application uh, packet, uh, which will ultimately result in approval of Africampton as a new medicine in uh, the therapy of HCM. I, I should caveat all that by saying, assuming everything goes, you know, perfectly yeah. well, and uh, and and it may, it may or, you know, may there's no guarantees and all those sorts of things. It's a clinical development is is a challenging. Uh, job. I've been doing this. Uh, I'm the head of research and development at Cytokinetics and have been working in this area for over 20 years now. And, and we have um, some successes. We also have failures. And, and the goal, obviously, is to try to maximize the successes um, and, and in that way bring you know, new potential therapies to patients. Um, so I think a, a little caution is good here. Um, I've personally participated in a number of clinical trials. Um, one or two of them, I thought it was going well from my side and they were ended because something happened someplace else and I thought it was going somewhere and it didn't. Um, so we go into this with the hope that we prove the point and that it works and the reality to know that it takes a lot of testing to come up with a couple of molecules that might or might not work and to me, even, I hate to use the word, a failed clinical trial is still a learning opportunity and we, we can refine and we can move forward. So it's, we're not looking for the only answer for everybody in one pill. We're looking for the answer for some in a, in a therapy. And we hope that we learn even more that maybe maybe things can develop out even, even further. Uh, and it's, a, you know, it's an incredible partnership, right? Obviously, partnering with patients, partnering with the physicians that take care of the patients. Um, it, you know, it, it's um, developing new medicines. You know, all of you probably, many of your listeners maybe watched the Super Bowl last weekend, but I think of developing new medicines as the ultimate team sport. Um, it requires people from all walks of life and expertise and, um, and patients as well that are willing to commit their time uh, and, and, you know, our regulatory infrastructure and all those things that ultimately allow us to develop, we hope, are medicines that are both effective and safe, or at least we understand their, um, their safety risks as well as their potential benefits. So that everyone can make an informed decision, if you will, about whether to use a medicine or not to use a particular medicine. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, what medical research, those of us that moved into pharma, you know, many of us uh, were physicians in this area that, that took care of patients and um, moved into, into pharma because we felt we might be able to put our, our um, efforts into developing medicines that might ultimately help more patients than we could see every day. So, um, but, but it's, uh, you know, it's great to see that, that we have so much more participation now from the patient community in, in these activities. That's the awesome part of what, what's happening here and why a collective community is, is okay. So I'm gonna tell everybody a secret about the founding of the HCMA from 1996. It's not a very well held secret because I've said this many times, but <laughs> when you're starting off with literally a blank paper. People don't know what hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is. Cardiologists I would go to didn't know what it was, didn't know how to handle it. So how are you gonna start an organization about a disease that nobody gives a damn about? So the first step, I built a triangle. I drew a triangle on a piece of paper and the bottom of the triangle was the general public. And the top of the triangle was centers of excellence. And at that point there were five of them in the United States. So I figured out that the patients who were sick and complaining, I had to get them up into these higher volume programs so that they weren't gonna get hurt in the community. Then we built centers of excellence. And as this started to build, I thought, you know, 
If we get enough people housed in a center and managed well, like Barry was just speaking of, we might actually get to the point where we can do like regular clinical trials and be like other diseases. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was 26 years ago, okay? It took a little while for the little engine that could here in Jersey to develop this entire infrastructure. And, you know, Steve, when you and I first talked, you know, a decade ago or whatever it was, probably longer than that now, but I'm sounding really old today. So I'm just going to call it a decade. We needed to have people in Oregon have some place to go. They didn't have any place to go that they knew about. So we had to develop that. And here we are today embarking upon clinical trials that have multiple sites. And yes, patients, there was a question in the, in the chat box about, well, how much time does this take? It takes time. You're going to have to commit your time and you may not get any benefit from it. You may be annoyed by the traffic or the drive or the echo or this, the blood draw, but it's the only way we're gonna learn. We all have to put something in the game. I've been in the clinical trials. I will be in clinical trials again for transplant if the opportunity arises. My family members will be in clinical trials. My father was in a clinical trial. My sister was in a clinical trial. We are all trying to make the future better for our next generation. And I got a new one in the clan. I don't know that you know this or not. And he's seven, seven months old now. And we don't know what his status is. Mm -hmm. So my little guy, I want him to be in a world free of worry of symptoms from HCM. If he has it, we'll manage it. But if he doesn't, great. <laughs> if he does, I want to know that we're doing our best. So I will contribute my time. I will participate in trials. I will fight for the answers for the next generation with amazing people and partners like those at Cytokinetics. I, lo I love the philosophy of the company. Robert's one of my fave people. So just saying, he's just <laughs> amazing. Um, and, and, and you care. And, and I appreciate that. And it's hard science. And yes, patients are going to have to try and participate. How many participants are you looking for in the phase three? Um, so right now, the study is powered at uh, 270. That means that we're recruiting about 270 patients uh, from around the world. Um, which will make Sequoia HCM the biggest hypertrophic cardiomyopathy trial um, in, in medical history. Um, so that's something that we're very proud of. And actually, you know, um, this is just one study that we're planning. So there are other studies um, coming down the pipeline that we will be uh, we'll be hoping to conduct um, as, as time goes by uh, and address um, we're hoping to address all of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients, whether you've got obstructive or what we call latent obstruction, non-obstructive HCM, really, you know, that's part of the allure of, of cytokinetics. You know, Fatty did mention, um, you know, this, this being a team sport and a partnership between patients and, and, and providers and institutions and researchers and so forth and so forth. But really the one thing that binds us all together which is very evident at Cytokinetics is, is our belief that the, you know, the patients are already our, our North Star. So when everybody is looking at a problem through a different lens, it really helps to remember what we're all here to achieve. Um, and you know, uh, yeah, the other thing that was mentioned is that we, uh, we were doctors, well, we still are. Uh, I mean, I still do see patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy regularly. Um, it's, it's something that really uh, I'm very passionate about, having boots on the ground. But at the same time, um, you know, this, this kind of aspiration of addressing, you know, people around the world that I may never get a chance to actually meet. I completely understand that from a different point of view. I do have to geek out for a minute and, and, and explain to the world that the first time I became aware of cytokinetics as a company, I was at the American Heart Association. It was set up time. So like the floors, were, like there was tractors and everything in the floor. And I go by this booth and they're building this, this moving cardiac sarcomere. I'm like, oh. what? 
<laughs> what are you doing? And I got my camera out and I videotaped it. I think I might've videotaped it on a Blackberry, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so that's dating it a little bit, but I geeked out and I watched your animatronics guys like getting the thing running for the first time. So as I understand it now that that mechanism has, has died and it's been moved around too many times, but I went to this booth and I'm like, cardiac sarcomere, cardio energetics, we're your people. We, we need to work. Oh, no, we're not there yet. I'm like, but you're coming. And I stalked him for a while. And one day I found Fatty at a meeting. I'm like, we need to talk. He's like, yes, we need to talk. And then they stole Steve. And then they told Dan Jacoby. And there we go. They, the rest is history. And now we we're borrow, on the brain. Borrowed them, Lisa. We've just borrowed them. So there's, <clears throat> but. Well, yes. When both it, told me they were leaving, I'm like, but I get to keep you in my, in my little pod of people. And. I here we like are. It. And you're here. And you're here. <laughs> and we're going to do big things. And we're going to maybe come up with some new answers for some new people. And that's fantastic. Um, so we're going to be pivoting off to Tanaya now, who is not too far from you guys, um, corporate wise. Uh, they're both, they were both out in California. So we're going to pivot off to there. So congratulations on the launching of the trial. Thank you Thanks so for much me. for participating in our first ever HCM Awareness Day. Last Wednesday of uh, February next year, we'll see you back. And I think we'll be seeing you a little bit before then to talk a little bit more about clinical trials and tell people how they can get engaged. And we're, we're, we're going to get that on the calendar soon too. Absolutely. So goodbye to Steve's Thank dog. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Fatty and Steve, thanks for being part of HCM Awareness Day. Thank, and we're going to do a quick pivot here. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Laura. Hi. Hello. Oh, you're how going to talk you? to us about Tanaya. Yeah, I'm honored to uh, follow Steve and Fatty, with whom I worked. I have learned a great deal from Fatty over the years, and uh, Steve was one of our absolutely ace investigators. So uh, I am really excited to see what happens with Sequoia. We're doing good. Things. I think a lot of people are, and and hopefully today a lot of people will be interested in signing up for a clinical trial and learning more about it and speaking to a a, a study coordinator. Yes, one of those centers of excellence. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> but but um, I, I'm Laura Robertson. I'm the executive director of um, sort of the gene therapy program at Tanaya. So you all have been talking today about uh, clinical trials and some really exciting new drugs, uh, the cardiac sarcomere inhibitors. And uh, Tanaya is now looking kind of at a different approach to addressing the genetic basis of HCM. So um, since a lot of this is new, I've got a slide presentation and I'll try to go through that. Please, oh, you may let me screen see. share away. Uh, I want to tell everybody share. that over the next year, HCMA and Tanaya will be working together to help advance general understanding of genetics. And we're going to be working on some curriculum so we can help everybody tune up on their genetic understanding. And I see that look on Laura's face, like, why isn't my screen share working? I know, yes, indeed. <laughs> Trust me. I think the first we time have I've seen it. it. There you go. Can people see my slides? They can. Okay. Good. I'm going to let you just have the day and I'm going to go on mute for a minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, no, I'm impressed. 26 years. This is really exciting. You have uh, pulled this together. And I'm so, only 28. Um, 28. Wow. <laughs> No, we, we need good patient advocacy and uh, good voices out there. So um, I wanted to describe a little bit about Tanaya's history, kind of what we're focusing on that's relevant for HCM, and uh, maybe do a quick uh, gene therapy background. Um, Tanaya is focused solely on heart disease, and we will look at any way to address different kinds of heart disease. It's the leading cause of death in the world. And when you think about all those new drug trials, so many of them are focused on oncology or other um, disease states. And so we really thought it was time to bring some new scientific discipline to uh, the different forms of heart disease. And we're really, again, motivated by the families who've been living with this. This family has five children, three of whom have undergone heart transplant. The oldest daughter <clears throat> has had a second transplant. And we want to look at genetic causes of diseases like this and see if we can change the course of the disease, not 
just treat the symptoms, but go to the underlying cause and see if we can deliver a therapy that changes the trajectory so this is not something that people uh, have in their future. Um, gene therapies have been kind of uh, at the, the, the new phase of uh, investigations and uh, many, many applications have gone into the FDA in the last um, five to seven years. Uh, currently, most of the gene therapies are targeted at other organs, diseases in the liver or in the eye. But uh, there are a couple now that are coming through. Two have been approved for uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and another one for spinal muscular atrophy. So, um, so we're looking to be one of the first companies to find um, a gene therapy for a specific heart disease. So we focus uh, on three things, precision medicine, small molecules, like we saw you know, for um, the cardiac sarcomere inhibitors. We're also looking at stem cells to regenerate uh, scarred heart muscle. And then today we'll be talking about gene therapy. What we really wanna do is look at uh, genetic defects that cause a um, lack of protein production that is really underlying a disease. And that is true of uh, myosin binding protein C3, MYBBC3, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we would like to, um, we're working on delivering a gene, uh, a good copy of that gene to the heart cells so that they can continue to function normally and hopefully change the course of the disease. So as I mentioned, our first one is MYBPC3. Um, this particular uh, gene defect is the most commonly um, identified one for people who undergo genetic testing uh, with H HCM. Um, many of you may have undergone uh, genetic testing. In about half the time, uh, no mutation is identified. Uh, and then the other half the time, approximately, a genetic defect in a sarcomere protein is identified. The most common is MYBPC3. And these genes, um, uh, so what does the gene do? <laughs> um, it creates, uh, it, it operates in the heart, it codes something called RNA that then codes a specific protein. The proteins in the sarcomere are the sort of the molecular motors of the heart. They get that heart to contract and relax and you know be that efficient pump that it's supposed to be. And mutations in this particular gene cause a decrease in something called myosin binding protein C3, that uh, does not enable the sarcomere to function normally, it becomes thick and stiff. And uh, as we can see here, let's see, we'll advance the slide. Um, regardless of where on that gene the defect occurs, we'll have um, all those signs of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with which you're familiar. I think it's really important to also recognize that this is not just a disease that occurs in adults. It occurs across the age range. And I think we're seeing some really good research now identifying younger and younger children who have um, <clears throat> hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so that they can receive treatment earlier. Um, so right now, as you've been you know, talking about all day, the there are many medications used to treat the symptoms of uh, cardiomyopathy, or in the uh, case of obstruction, you can have uh, an ablation or a surgical myectomy. All of these treatments go after the symptoms. None of them address the underlying cause of that disease. So we would like to take a couple steps back, see if we can identify um, a way to uh, reverse the trajectory of that disease and have the heart perhaps remodel over time. And therefore, you know, the ultimate goal would be that people carrying this gene uh, mutation would be able to have a therapy that restores normal heart function, reduces their symptoms, reduces their risk of um, arrhythmic events and all those um, really kind of 
impediments to having a good quality of life. So um, that is our goal. And we are in the research stage of uh, developing this initial uh, gene therapy. The uh, myosin BPC3 uh, protein is shown here in yellow in the bottom right. And it's important for helping uh, with the con contraction velocity in the heart. So it's a key protein. Let's see. So um, the idea, like I said, we wanna get at the underlying cause and treat the cause of the disease so that we can modify uh, what kind of the evolution of that disease is over time. The goal is to give a single uh, IV dose of this medication or this gene therapy and see that it then uh, helps the heart produce the normal protein durably over time. So it's a one-time treatment that um, and then kind of resets the uh, genetic mechanism in the heart muscle. I know the tradition has been to talk about obstructive and non-obstructive uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In this case, we're kind of looking at the disease differently. We're looking at the underlying gene. So uh, our clinical trials, when they start, will be targeted uh, at people who have that genetic uh, makeup, but not necessarily whether or not they have obstructive or non-obstructive disease um, or if they've had a myectomy and still have symptoms. But if, um, so, so we're kind of looking at um, how to approach uh, this disease differently. So, and uh, as you've seen with clinical trials, it's really important not only to see that durable response for us, you know, uh, scientifically, but we need to know that this really matters to a, a person who has been living with this. Uh, can they function better? Are they able to do uh, more daily activities without worrying about arrhythmias or shortness of breath or chest pain? What, what are those kind of symptoms and quality of life changes that we can uh, achieve as well, uh, as well as all those things the FDA likes, uh, like uh, changes in echo and exercise capacity? So we, we need to have a successful program. We need to have all those elements. So a uh, brief tutorial on what gene therapy is. Um, we, this big gray uh, sphere here in the middle uh, is what's called the capsid. This is a, a virus. Uh, it's a naturally occurring virus that really doesn't cause any symptoms uh, in adults. Many of us have been exposed to it and have antibodies to it, but it's uh, kind of a benign uh, virus but it has uh, the ability to uh, have us load what they call the cassette. This is the kind of the blue line there, that whole bar in the middle. The cassette uh, can be inserted in here and it will include a full length normal gene, uh, it's in pink. And then we <clears throat> put promoters uh, onto that uh, and that will target the heart muscle tissue specifically to deliver uh, the gene right to that cardiomyocyte. So that is kind of the, the uh, delivery package. And uh, so this, uh, this disease uh, model has been uh, kind of developed in mice and we've tested this uh, viral gene therapy delivery um, uh, model in mice. In the mice, however, they don't get the uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy version of MYBPC3. Uh, they get big, thick, dilated, poorly functioning heart. So you see in these two little videos, WT is wild type. That's the normal mouse. And on the right is uh, the mouse model that has the MYBPC3 uh, gene defect. So when we look at uh, on the left side, you have the wild type, this is normal and black, and then blue are the uh, mice <clears throat> that got, um, uh, that do not have, they only have one gene. The other, and then the red are the ones who have both genes knocked out. And you can see over time, just kind of visually that the heart does not function properly. So starting with mice that look like the ones on the right, uh, 
They were given an IV infusion of the gene therapy. The kind of the normal ones are gray and the left-hand uh, graph here, sorry. The normal is in gray. Red are uh, the mice that had the gene therapy and black are the placebo group. So you can see they started with sort of uh, kind of heavy, thick hearts at the beginning uh, on the left-hand side. And over time, after receiving the gene therapy, um, the ones in red, the ones who were treated, have a more normal uh, heart than the ones uh, who were treated with the placebo. It's a little bit easier to distinguish this in the next two graphs in the middle. Uh, it's showing ejection fraction, how well does the heart squeeze versus time. And over time, the mice that were treated are the ones in red. And uh, over uh, 15 months, they have kind of uh, restoration of normal function and durability of that response. Whereas the ones who had the gene defect but did not receive the treatment have a decreasing function over time. That's very clear on the final uh, figure here on the right. Uh, there's a distinct survival benefit over that 15 month period. Um, so in red at the top with 100, all the mice who were treated with this gene therapy survived uh, to 15 months. Whereas the ones in blue who had the gene defect but no therapy uh, did not survive. Um, when we look at, you know, did, did the treatment get to the heart and have the effect that we need to see? The gene uh, indeed made it to the heart here. Uh, you can see kind of each of these uh, graphs. One is the RNA that uh, translates the code from the new gene to protein. So there's an increase in the amount of RNA and protein in the hearts of the mice who received the treatment. And these are just different doses. So the higher the dose, the higher um, the expression of RNA and the protein that will make the sarcomere function normally. So um, this was an important sort of proof of concept. And then a, kind of a more visual way maybe to understand this is uh, to look at the heart um, biopsies. So the red uh, staining on these uh, heart tissues is for the presence of this protein, the MYBPC3. So the first uh, photograph is a normal mouse heart. The second one that's very dark uh, is just uh, the mouse with um, both gene defects and who did not get treated. And then the two on the right are the mice with the gene defects who were treated with the um, two different doses of the gene therapy. And you can see uh, that there's some of that bright red expression of the MYBPC3 protein. So these uh, early studies, because we're still preclinical, uh, show that the, uh, the gene was delivered to the heart and it uh, produced the necessary protein. But we also care that about how well that heart functioned once the um, protein has been delivered and uh, is in <clears throat> full action. So uh, these three graphs kind of show the red bars are the treated uh, mice. So uh, the first one on the left is increasing ejection fraction, a better contractility uh, as time goes on. And uh, they, these are three different doses, each of those red bars. So there was a clear improvement in ejection fraction over those who were not treated. Again, uh, in the middle, you know, there's less hypertrophy. Um, their heart weights are less than the ones who were not treated in blue. And in the other um, area we're trying to quantify is, is there a change in the ECGs? And uh, mice don't have the same arrhythmias that humans do, but we're looking for ECG changes. Um, and so that also, uh, we're looking at the QT interval here, which did improve relative to the untreated mice. So uh, that's mice, that's data pre presented about a year ago. Um, there will be more coming out later, um, but it's not public yet. 
But in the meantime, uh, we are busy planning uh, our investigational new drug application for this compound. Um, and this is sort of a schematic of what we're planning for our human clinical trials. Um, because a lot of uh, information on uh, HCM has been uh, gathered kind of as obstructive or non obstructive and not really looking at the gene defect behind each of these um, uh, forms of HCM, we have started here in this uh, long medium blue line here, a registry study to look at what's the natural history. You know, if you are identified as having this gene mutation at an early age, what does that look like over time? So our first study is uh, a natural history study to gather information on children uh, with MYBPC3 mutations. Um, there are also data out there from the SHARE registry, with which you may be familiar about adults with this particular um, mutation. But right now, we also would like to cover the entire age range and understand um, sort of infants to 18-year-olds. So that has started. Uh, meanwhile, we are planning uh, an initial first in human adult study and um, people who have fairly severe uh, non, non obstructive uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with this particular gene defect, uh, or uh, people who've had uh, myectomy but still have a lot of symptoms and um, are really uh, have run out of medication options. So the adult studies will, um, you know, has still under design, but uh, will continue uh, to tell you uh, updates as we go. Uh, Kind of down in the third line here, there's an infant study listed. There's a form of this disease where uh, rarely uh, infants will be born with two copies, two bad copies of this gene. Uh, they tend to cluster in um, like the old order Amish community, uh, some in the Netherlands, but occasionally you know, found elsewhere in Europe, US and Canada. These infants are born and are sick either prenatally or right after birth. Uh, they either die or go to heart transplant in the first few months of life. So if we are able to prove that uh, the gene delivery uh, works in humans, starting with the adults, uh, we will uh, plan to apply to the FDA to do um, a study in these very, very sick infants uh, as the next kind of phase of our development. Um, and then as always, we uh, have a long-term extension study for anyone who's participated in the trial to, uh, to follow them for safety over time. So uh, I mentioned we have this uh, one study started, it's called My Climb. It's uh, looking at the natural history for children uh, under 18 with the MyBBC3 uh, gene mutation. And we really want to you know, just collect data. This uh, involves uh, going to the normal cardiology visit. Uh, you know, once a year, uh, parents will fill out questionnaires about how the child is doing. Um, you know, the doctors will enter some of the information about echoes and ECGs, um, and there will be uh, one blood draw every year to look at some biomarker changes to understand kind of what, what changes over time. How does this disease progress? How can we better understand it? So um, that just opened uh, last week. And this is the uh, the website for it. We're calling it My Climb. Uh, Tanaya is named after a lake and a peak in Yosemite. So we have uh, a lot of uh, metaphors here for climbing mountains. So My Climb Natural History Study is the, uh, the website that you can access. Uh, I think you can put it in Google. And uh, the other really important person on our team, uh, some of you may know, is Wendy Borsari. Uh, she is running all of our patient advocacy uh, efforts and outreach. Uh, she's been very generous with explaining uh, what it's been like for her and her family to live with HCM. And uh, she has been our kind of main point of uh, 
contact and kind of helping us think about how to better uh, design trials uh, as we reach out to other patients as well. But how, how can we make this most beneficial uh, for people living with HCM? So this is uh, Wendy's email address. Should you have any questions? Um, Wendy is uh, kind of her uh, answer person for anything uh, HCM or uh, gene therapy development related. So, uh, and I uh, believe, so uh, just as I mentioned, we are really committed to finding ways to transform, uh, you know, the lives of individuals and families with uh, living with this heart disease by making uh, something available that actually transforms the course of that disease and uh, you know, potentially someday uh, we're hoping to have curative therapies and not ones that just uh, treat the symptoms. But uh, we are just uh, finishing up our uh, early uh, preclinical research and uh, we will let you know how things go here uh, on your next meeting. Thank you for uh, having me. I will uh, please stop share here. <laughs> I'm glad I was still on mute because I had a sneezing fit and oh, no. I just coughed. Um, so I was on mute. So <clears throat> when I talk about matters being close to my heart, literally, um, I am a myosin binding protein C mutation. And I thought I would take this opportunity. Um, she's going to go back to bed after this. I pulled out. For those who know me, I pulled out the bag. Oh. And this is where she lives. Thank you. So if you don't want to see what a real heart with HCM looks like plastinized, then look away right now. Yeah. But this is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a myosin binding protein C mutation. This is what scarring looks like, all that white stuff in there. Yeah. How I lived with this as long as I did, I still don't fully understand how this did its job. Um, and it did for a great many years, and I'm happy with that. However, if there is something that we can do to stop that from happening and never have to go through a 10-year, a 12-year-old being diagnosed with heart disease, fainting, nearly fainting, stroke at 21, five implantable devices, and a heart transplant, and a stroke, forgot about the stroke, that would be a really good thing. That'd be a really good thing. We are early days. There's a little of a little enthusiasm here. I don't think it's unbridled yet. Just, there's enthusiasm. Yeah. And I think there's a right to be enthusiastic about science and discovery. But we've got a long way to go. And it's going to take a team to get there. And we're really happy to have forward thinking individuals like those involved with Tanaya and this therapy as part of the HCM community now. Like you're, you're new to the game. So welcome to our world and thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, we are going to pivot from here. We really look forward to working with you. We're going to be doing some more work. You'll be back on later in the year, providing some more input, either you or somebody from the company. Um, and thanks out to Wendy, who I've known for a really long time now. And yay, Wendy, we're doing good things. So big hearted girls stick together. <laughs> okay. So Thank you, Laura, so much for joining us on HCM Awareness Day. We really do appreciate that. We're going to go and pivot. And for those of you who are watching on Facebook, um, I am sorry that I was supposed to stop earlier and then restart. So we're going to go straight through on Facebook until about, oh, we're probably going to stop at about six-ish, and then I'll break to the next session. And we'll just go straight to session four. This is two, three. I've gotten almost everything logistically correct today, except for that. So sorry about that. All right. So we are going to pivot to my computer here for a little bit. And we heard from Saito. We heard from Tanaya. And now we're going to hear from Celtrion. Celtrion's company is located overseas. They're in Korea. And uh, times were not conducive to them participating in live time here. So we are going to go and hear from them on tape. And if I mute my microphone, you don't hear what's on my screen. So I'm gonna black out my screen. I'm going to leave the microphone on and you will hear 
Celtrion talk about their trial. And we will be dropping a link in for you to uh, fill out a questionnaire if you might think that you want to participate in one of these trials that they're talking about. So without further ado, Celtrion. Good afternoon. I'm Jason, the head of medical development at Hotel Celtrion. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to introduce Celtrion on HCM Awareness Day. I will start with a brief video introducing the company overview and development history. In 2002, we had no correct answer. We all have kept working to turn possibility into reality. Today and every day is a new day for us because we never stop taking on challenges. Celtrion이 가려던 길은 누구도 가본 적 없었던 길이었습니다. 정답은 없었지만 우리는 확신을 가지고 항상 도전했었습니다. 매일 새로운 도전, 그것이 셀트리온의 정신이라고 생각합니다. Biosimilar market was a blue ocean in biopharmaceutical industry with very high barriers to entry. Celtrion overcame this, entering the market through creative business model, CMO business that strengthens the stepping stone of new drug development, setting new standards in this industry. Followed by the commercialization of the world's first antibody biosimilar Remzima, Celtron commercialized Trixima for the treatment of blood cancer and Herzuma for the treatment of breast cancer in all approved markets. And also Celtron is in progressive development of a new drug for seasonal influenza and biobetters, which is enhancing its existing biopharmaceuticals. Biosimilar is a low cost drug, and the price of biosimilar is the same as biosimilar. The price of biosimilar is the same as biosimilar, but the price of biosimilar is the same as biosimilar. 전문가들조차 불가능하다고 여겼던 분야입니다. 그러나 셀트리온은 세계 최초로 항체 바이오시밀러를 개발했고 지금은 바이오시밀러를 전 세계 환자들에게 공급하고 있습니다. 셀트리온은 현재에 만족하지 않고 더 많은 환자들을 위한 항체 신약을 개발하는 한편 전 세계의 유통 네트워크를 확장해 더욱 세계적인 생명공학 회사로 성장해 나갈 것입니다. Why we look forward to Celtrion's growth? It is because we have the advanced capacity from strict quality control system, state-of-the-art production facilities, to the world's best production technology. Celtrion's production facilities designed and built to comply with international regulations, such as those of the US and Europe, and has proven its technology and stability globally by achieving US FDA's approval for the first time as a company from Asia. Celtrion has a state-of-the-art protein drug production facility with a total of 140,000 liters scale and is capable of manufacturing and supplying antibody biosimilar at the top volume in the world. Celtrion has built up the world-class production technology and know-how from primary cell culture to the production of final drug product and will never stop researching and developing in order to keep growing as a leading global biopharmaceutical company. A leader of biosimilar Celtrion. Based on Celtrion Healthcare in charge of marketing, Celtrion Farm, a chemical drug manufacturer, Celtrion Skin Cure, Celtrion Chemical Research Institute, and Celtrion Holdings. Celtrion is growing fast by expanding global networks. Celtrion 
또 인류가 더 건강하게 살아가는 데 기여할 수 있는 기업으로 성장해 나가려 노력하고 있습니다. 그것이 셀트리온의 철학이고 또그 철학이 지켜질 때 셀트리온은 모든 사람들이 와서 일하고 싶어하는 기업, 존경받는 기업이 될수 있을 것이라 생각합니다. Biologics have already shown dynamic growth with no limits, proving its significant economical value and potential in global pharmaceutical market. Especially, Celtrion, as a leader of biosimilar, has led the new blue ocean to success and is opening a new future of the pharmaceutical industry with proven result of reducing national healthcare spending. A future that brings a happy life to all mankind. To fulfill this value, Celtrion will keep moving forward. Another 10 years from now, what would it be like? In our tomorrow, we will continue to advance and keep moving towards new frontiers. We will transform higher value into a reality and share this value with many people. I hope this video clip helps you understanding who we are. We are a company located in South Korea. Zetrion is the biggest pharmaceutical company in Korea, and we have more than 2,000 employees. Our key product, Lamsima, has been approved and used in 94 countries globally. Our revenue as of 2020 is $1,608 million. Zetrion is known as biosimilar pioneer, but we continue innovation for patients' health and living. This is our key product portfolio. We have three biosimilar products. This is Lamsima, the treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. This is Truxima, the treatment for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. This is Herjuma, the treatment for breast cancer. We also have the innovative biosimilar, the subcutaneous products of Lamsima. In order for us to respond to COVID-19 pandemic situation, Centrion has developed monoclonal antibody treatment, which is Recurona. And it is uh, currently available in numerous countries, including Korea and Europe. We also have COVID-19 in vitro test kit, which is currently available in the United States under the name of Diatrust Antigen Test. Zetrion has three plants in Korea. We have two biosimilar plants and one oversolid plant. We manufacture the best quality products in the facilities certified by global health authorities, including the United States FDA and European Medicine Agency. Zetrion has global distribution network in more than 90 countries worldwide. Our products are distributed through these networks. Centrion will invest 34 billion US dollar for Bison 2030. We were the first mover and then we would like to be a game changer. Centrion left successful footprint on biosimilar industry. Aside from our successful history, we will continue innovation for providing innovative treatment for patients. I would like to introduce a new drug candidate for HCM, which is called CTG20. But let me briefly explain Cybenzolin first. Cybenzolin is the drug which has been used in Japan, France, and Belgium as an anti arrhythmic drug for over 30 years. Cybenzolin is one of the class 1A anti arrhythmic drugs. It works mainly by blocking sodium channel. Among the countries, Japan allows it for off-label treatment for HCM. We conduct clinical trial to develop a new drug for the treatment of obstructive HCM using this compound, Cybenzolin. We extract a part of cybenzolin and we call it S-cybenzolin. 
Its program name is CTG20. Target product profile is to have totality of safety and efficacy profile greater than or equal to standard of care. We expect it is possible based on the following points. Firstly, long-term safety data of cyberzolin has been accumulated over 30 years. Secondly, clinical studies for the efficacy of cyberzolin on obstructive HCM have been conducted over 15 years. It will be developed as an extended release taking every 12 or 24 hours to improve patient medication convenience. We are going to conduct multiple clinical trials in several countries. And then the final goal is to obtain FDA approval by 2025 and make it available to the HCM patient. Thank you for your attention to my presentation. If you have any question or if you are interested to participate in our ongoing study in the United States, please feel free to contact us or the HCMA representative. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we have a sneak in item on our agenda. Dr. Harry Lever, <clears throat> I think is with us right now. Excuse me, I'm a little coughing right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Harry, are you with us? Harry, are you with us? I don't think we have Harry live. He's on mute, asked to unmute. We have just a few minutes and I wanted to try to get him in to comment on uh, generic drug quality. Okay, so we, we don't have Harry Lever right now, but we're gonna bring him back. Um, we are gonna get him on here today, God willing. Um, we are going to move to another segment here. And we've talked a lot about clinical trials. We got some really heavy clinical scientific information. So for all of you who kept with it all, Good for you, you get extra credit points because that got a little deep at some points if you're a patient. So we, we have to work on helping everybody understand a lot of the data there. So we're going to bring in two, uh, two or three, I guess at this point, of our discussion group leaders. So about a year and a half ago, we started because of COVID in part, our, our in-person support groups were ended. Um, and we had to pivot to what everybody else did, let's do it on Zoom. So we started this concept of, um, of discussion groups and we recruited some members of the community. And I see two of them here today. I don't know if Bob and Paul are joining as well, but if we wanna bring Deborah and Karen up, oh, there's Paul, okay. <clears throat> and Deb and Karen. Um, and here we go, guys. Let's do this Brady Bunch style. Hey guys, <laughs> Team HCMA, yay. yay, yay, we do all the, we do all the shouting. So I, I, I know we didn't practice this because girls been a little crazy here getting all this going, but you guys talk about HCM like every week at least, and you have your discussion groups. So I was hoping we could do a little round robin and you could tell us a quick little thing about who you are and what kind of groups you're on and how has it been going? So I'm going to start with Paul because he jumped in first and then I'll go Paul, Deborah, Karen. So Paul, tell us about you and your group. Uh, hi, Lisa. Um, the group that uh, I co-host with Greg LaValle is called All Things Myectomy. And what we try to do is we'll uh, get folks who have scheduled their myectomy, have it coming up in the next couple of months, or they're uh, considering whether to have a myectomy. And we just get together and talk about what the process is, uh, find out what questions they have. And it just gives people an opportunity to ask questions. And everybody has different concerns about it when they're considering having a myectomy. And it, it just gives people a chance to uh, ask about the things that are on their mind. 
And we've been fortunate in a number of these sessions, we'll have people who just had a myectomy in the last month or two, who had been in our sessions previously, who come on and uh, kind of give the uh, latest uh, of uh, what it was like to go through it and how it compared with what they expected. And we've had people anywhere from Australia to Hawaii and every place in between. So I think it, it's been great uh, uh, for all of us to hear their stories. And I think it's been helpful to people to, to be able to uh, ask questions about the things that are concerning them. So Paul, why are you interested in all things my activity? Well, I'm interested in it because uh, I went through the process uh, myself. I had a myectomy uh, in uh, June of 2015 at the Cleveland Clinic. I was diagnosed in 2013. And um, at the time that I was considering to have a myectomy, uh, there really was nobody to talk to about it. I don't know anybody locally who has HCM or who's been through a myectomy. And so I was stuck with trying to go through YouTube and find anything that might possibly be helpful. So I, I just think it's a way to, to find people who have been through it. It's not easy to find in your, your uh, local area and uh, to talk about what's on your mind. Fantastic. <clears throat> Deborah, why don't you tell us a little bit about why you're a discussion group leader and what's the group that you run? Absolutely. Uh, so I'm Deborah Rafson. I am 43 years old. I was diagnosed with HCM when I was 32. Um, I also had a septal myectomy. Mine was in 2016, and I had an ICD implanted um, six days after my surgery. So I have been interested in finding a support group for um, HCM for a long time, and this was when I saw that Lisa was starting these up, I immediately said, I, I want to participate because, you know, like Paul said, it, it has historically been really difficult to find other people um, that you know that have this disease. But here we are, a humongous community um, that just needed a way to be connected to each other. So that's been really valuable. Um, the group that I run is on life with HCM, which sounds very general, um, and it is intended to be. Um, every month, we, we sort of use the topic of the month that the HCMA provides to us as a way to focus in on something. But what I've found in the discussions is that people are really just looking for an outlet to share their stories, ask any questions that have come up, maybe from a recent doctor's appointment or something that's been going on that they haven't had anyone to talk to about it. And so, you know, sometimes the, the direction of the conversation will go towards the topic of the month. And sometimes we find that there's something else that comes up that people really get engaged in. And that's the direction we go instead. And that's sort of the beauty of these. They're they're not particularly structured in such a way that we have to focus on one thing. And I feel like I know I've gotten a lot out of hearing from the people who participate. So I hope the participants are also getting a lot out of them. Um, and I will take a moment to plug my uh, group because it's coming up tomorrow night um, at seven o'clock. And I see that Ross was kind enough to drop a link to uh, to sign up for the discussion groups in the chat. So if anyone is interested in joining us to especially after being so um, inspired and probably having so many questions come up uh, after all of today's uh, fantastic presentations. You know, come, come chat more with us, uh, 7 o'clock Eastern tomorrow night. Uh, you just need to register for the Zoom link, and that will be sent to you. So I hope to see many of you there. Fantastic. And probably the person on the page that I've known the longest, um, and I even knew her dad, so HCM is a generational thing. Karen, why don't you tell us a little bit about why you're a discussion group leader and what your group is? Okay. Um, well, the reason I decided to become a discussion group leader is I just wanted to give back to the community. I've gotten a lot from the HCMA, and um, I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of people just want, as, as uh, Paul said, you know, just to share their stories. Um, and so I was put into the ICD group with a, my co-host, Seidel Zinn. I'm sorry, she's not here today. I 
really enjoy hosting with her and we seem to complement each other um, quite a bit. Uh, I'm a New Yorker and my Midwesterner. Exactly, exactly. Although we tend, unlike Paul, uh, most of ours tend to be on the East Coast. Once in a while we'll get someone Midwest, but uh, they tend to be on the East Coast. So the rest of you, we need you to come and, and help me out here, please. <laughs> I'm being inundated by East Coasters. <laughs> but um, I received, I was diagnosed in 2003 and received my ICD a month later. Uh, since then, it has gone off appropriately nine times. So I do have a little bit of experience with an ICD. Uh, between that and members of my family who also have ICDs, um, we've probably had just about any experience you can imagine with one. So um, I enjoy it. I really enjoy our discussion groups. We tend to um, just talk about what the uh, different members want to talk about. There's people who have ICDs already and have questions about it or need to share their experience. We've got people who have been advised to get an ICD and really want to check out what having an ICD would be like and, and to decide whether or not they want to go through with that. So there is a great variety of conversation going on and nobody is ever, you have HCM, you are never more than like 48 hours away from a group discussion. And even if it's not hundred percent on target and you want to just kind of show up and say, I have HCM, I don't know if this is the great, right group for me, show up. I run a group myself. I actually run two um, a month. I, I give one over to Paul and crew for my, the pre myectomy stuff. So I've I've delegated some, but I run the newly diagnosed group. So that is newly diagnosed with HCM or new to the HCMA so that people under, get a base understanding of HCM. They understand what a center is. They know some language. And then I tell them a little bit about how the HCMA is structured and it's organized and how they can get involved or what services they can use. The other group I run is one that I am a constituent of and that's Transplant Pathways. Now we started Transplant Pathways a little over a year ago. And it's an extraordinary group because you start off, oh my God, they said the T word. And then we're cheering them on as they're going through the procedure. And right now this week, right as we speak, we have two HCM transplant warriors who were both transplanted over the weekend and are both doing really well. The guys met a couple of weeks ago in the last transplant pathway meeting. And they look in the camera and they say, I don't know when the call is coming. I just want the call. And they got the call within 24 hours of each other and ended up transplanting on the same day. So we're there to support them pre-transplant as they approach transplant and after transplant. So it's a unique group of people. We're unusual for even in the HCM community, but we're there for each other. And we stick with the themes of the month. So it's heart month. So it's awareness month. And what is everybody going to be doing to raise awareness? And why do you think it's important and get them to advocate for themselves? But we have other themes of the month, um, emotional wellness, um, understanding family history, family screenings, why are they important and things on that nature. So we have a bunch of other groups. Go on the website and learn about them. These are an amazing group of people. They're all vetted through the HCMA. They have all taken HIPAA training. They all are aware that your privacy as a patient is critical. What happens in the room stays in the room. And we encourage people to be camera on, microphone on, participating. So everybody knows who's there. And it's been an amazing process watching them grow. My last newly diagnosed group two weeks ago had almost 30 registrants in a, in, in a month. I may have to start running that one twice a month because that was a little hard to manage. Not, no offense to anybody that was there, but there's a lot of questions coming in. There's a lot of different people. So like 2025 is, re, is really the cap on those, I would say. 
So we're, they're getting better populated. They're, they're happening all the time and I encourage all to sign in. Any parting thoughts for HCM Awareness Day, guys? And then I'll let you run away. I think it's a great idea. Thank you for doing it. Well, we, we, we have a lot of partners in this and thanks to our partners, we're able to pull all of this together. And if you're watching online, keep checking out the Facebook feed because you're also going to see all the media clips that we had going out this week. And you'll see Nat Martinez and I interviewing with different people around the country and you can watch those videos. We ask that you like the page and share the content because that's how we're going to raise awareness. So I, all, I call all of those in the HCM community, HCM warriors. And then there are HCM warrior leaders and the individuals who have stepped up to be discussion group leaders are certainly warriors, but certainly great leaders by example. And I thank you very much for contributing your time and expertise to help the community stay together and stay yeah. sane. <laughs> thank you. Oh, well, you're welcome. Glad to be here. I'm going to do the fast HCM Awareness Day pivot out. And thank you all for being here and telling us a little bit about your stuff. You guys can all go run away and have a nice night and tune into the rest of the content because now we're going to hear from Embryo Pharmaceuticals on a new clinical trial. So we're going to do a pivot again. Thanks, guys. Hey. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. So I am back. Oh, here comes Vanessa. Hello, Vanessa. And we should have, who else is coming in? Who else is coming in? Gotta say, we've been doing pivots pretty well today, people. We're doing pretty good. I've only had one screw up where I forgot to stop Facebook, but otherwise I think we're good. Okay, Vanessa, is somebody else coming from Embrya today? Um, I think we have Arash with us as well. And oh, here um, he comes. That's what I thought. Arash is here. We okay. should have Paul also, um, but I'm not sure. Oh, there's pa Paul is Vanessa. Vanessa, you're looking very Paul-like today. You were behind my screen. That's why I thought you were. The other one. <laughs> I think we okay. used the same link. Oh, sorry about that. We, 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 we aren't perfect today, but we'll be there soon. Um, okay. I have your slides, correct? Yes. Yeah. We have a, a pre-recording to share. Okay, so it, did anybody want to make opening comments before I bring that slide up? Yeah, sure, um, I will. I, I would first uh, begin by saying um, thank you for having us today. Uh, this has been a fantastic uh, experience hearing all the stories, all the efforts, all the outreach, and we're really pleased um, that we were asked to join today. Um, my name's Paul Chamberlain. I'm the head of clinical development at Imbria Pharmaceuticals. Uh, we're a small company based in Boston, and we are developing a drug um, for cardiovascular diseases. And in particular, we are interested in HCM. And in fact, we're um, developing the drug for non-obstructive um, HCM. And so what we hope to do today is uh, explain a little bit about why we think this drug will work um, in HCM. Um, it's less about the clinical study itself. It's more about the reasons why we believe it will work. And what we've done is we uh, have a pre-recorded presentation by uh, Professor Michael Freneau, who's a world-renowned uh, cardiologist and an expert in um, uh, cardiac and inherited diseases. So we can tee that up and we'll play it. And Vanessa Arash, my uh, colleague, who's our uh, chief scientific officer, we're online here and we can certainly answer any questions, any follow-up questions after the presentation. It's, it's about 12 minutes long. So we're here and um, yeah, let, let's get started. Okay, let's get this started. And I'm gonna ask you guys to mute your mics so we don't have any background noise because Michael's a little quiet. Where'd it go? Ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked today to briefly explain the rationale for the use of IMD 101 to improve symptoms in patients with non obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the heart is a, a truly astonishing pump. Uh, when one thinks that it pumps, even at rest, around five liters of blood every minute for the whole of our lives, and can massively increase that to perhaps 20 liters a minute uh, during exercise 
and does so without problems throughout the whole of our lives. One can understand that to do so, it requires a huge amount of energy. And that energy is generated in little organelles within the heart muscle cells known as mitochondria. And these burn substrates, fats and sugar mainly, to generate a molecule called ATP, which is the energy supply for all cell functions. But the ATP is short-lived. And so in order to both store this energy, but also to transport it from the place where it's made in the mitochondria to the place within the cells where it's used, ATP combines with a molecule called creatine to produce a molecule called phosphocreatine, which transports the energy to the site of use. And at the site of use, the ATP is cleaved off. Every day of our lives, it's been calculated that the adult human heart cycles at least six kilos of ATP. And it does so by burning substrates, as I mentioned. And in fetal life, that's mainly glucose and lactate. But the adult human heart uh, typically generates about 70% of its ATP from fatty acids, but it's what's called a metabolic omnivore. It can adjust the source of its energy according to particular circumstances. We can assess in patients the energy status of the heart using an MRI technique called phosphorus spectroscopy. An energetic impairment manifests as a reduction in ratio of this molecule phosphocreatine to ATP. And I think the best way to understand that is that phosphocreatine is both a transport and a storage medium for energy. And the ATP is the immediate source of energy. So it's rather anal analogous to the checking account and the savings account that we have in our bank. So um, we, all, we all try to live on less than our income and to put money aside in our savings account. But sometimes our expenses become greater than our income. And the only way we can do that is by eating into our savings account to keep our checking account um, from going into the red. Well, in the same way, if if, if the heart is not generating enough energy to meet its needs, the only way that it can maintain the immediate source of energy is to eat into its savings, into its phosphocreatine. So this explains why the phosphocreatine to ATP ratio becomes reduced. And we know from many studies now that the phosphocreatine to ATP ratio is pretty much universally reduced in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And importantly, we know that even when we study patients very early in life, before they've developed hypertrophy, they manifest this reduction in energy status. So why is this? Well, in around 60% of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a mutation can be identified in, uh, in a number of different proteins. And the vast majority of these, these are proteins involved in what's called a sarcomere. And the sarcomere is the basic contractile unit in muscle, including heart muscle. And there are several different proteins involved in the sarcomere. And these are shown here, they include actin and myosin, but also others like troponin, tropomyosin, and so on. And uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has been found to be due to mutations of any of a number of these different proteins. And the purpose of the sarcomere is to uh, cause the contraction and the relaxation of the heart. And this occurs due to a sliding of the actin and myosin filaments, with the actin sliding over the myosin through a ratchet-like effect. And I'll show you that in a moment. So this is the myosin and this is the actin. And across bridge forms, which requires uh, energy, ATP, and it actually causes a power stroke, which moves the actin along, and that process, that, uh, that ratchet process, each ratchet of that process requires the use of ATP. And we know that these abnormal sarcomere proteins result in an increased cycling of these cross bridges between the myofilaments, and that increases the energy cost of generating force. So it effectively it wastes energy. And some uh, Theoretical calculations based on some, some work in, in experimental models suggest that that increased cost results in about a threefold increased requirement of energy to generate the same amount of tension. So in addition to this direct effect of the mutations in Hocum, 
many patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have abnormalities, that's to say thickening of the small blood vessels within the heart muscle. And these can limit the blood flow to the heart and result in a reduction in oxygen delivery and indeed reduction in delivery of substrates. So what are the consequences of this energetic impairment? Well, the first is um, ion channels, these little channels in the cell membrane and in the membranes within the heart muscle cell itself, which transmit ions across them. These require large amounts of energy. So impaired energetics impairs the function of these ion channels. In particular, this leads to an increase in the calcium levels within the cell. And that increased calcium activates pathways that lead to the development of thickening or hypertrophy of the heart. And in experimental models, it appears that this appears to the, be the principal cause of hypertrophy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And an increased cellular calcium also may increase the likelihood of rhythm disturbances of the heart. But particularly importantly for the purposes of what we're going to be discussing today, uh, relaxation of the heart requires very large amounts of energy. And when we exercise and the heart rate increases, the heart must relax much faster than it does at rest. And that requires vast amounts of energy. And because the heart has not enough energy, it can't do so. So we and others have shown that the principal cause of exercise limitation in patients with non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is that the heart <coughs> just can't relax fast enough on exercise. So its output is blunted and that prevents uh, sufficient uh, blood flow to the muscle uh, in order to be able to exercise to a normal level. So how can we impact on this in a positive way? Well, one way is to alter the heart's metabolism in order to improve the efficiency of energy generation. And I mentioned at the beginning that the principal substrates used to generate energy are fats and sugar, and that in adult life, fats tend to be the principal substrate. Well, it turns out that it's more efficient to use sugar than to use fats. And again, to choose an analogy on the right-hand side, I'm showing you a figure, which is the fuel consumption of two Land Rovers, which are driving across Africa. One is diesel and the other is petrol. So the diesel is the, uh, this one here and the petrol is in blue. And you can see that at every stage of the journey, the petrol vehicle is using more fuel, more gasoline uh, than the diesel uh, is, is consuming of the diesel at each stage. So the, the, the diesel is more efficient in terms of uh, delivering uh, the, the uh, mileage of the, the vehicle. Well, in the same way, using sugar is more efficient in terms of generating energy. And partially inhibiting the use of fatty acids by the heart, we know reciprocally increases the amount of glucose that's used, and, 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 and therefore it improves the efficiency of energy generation. So would this work in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Well, we have a proof of concept. We previously undertook a study evaluating the use of a drug called Pahexlin in patients with non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Pahexlin is a drug that actually inhibits the uptake of fatty acids into these organelles called mitochondria. And that results in a reciprocal increase in the use of sugar, the use of glucose. And this was a randomized controlled trial, uh, placebo controlled. And uh, you can see, we looked at the energy status of the heart. This is the placebo group, and this is the perhexlene. And you can see that on perhexlene, there was a substantial increase in the phosphocreatine ATP ratio, uh, indicating that it improved the energetic status. And not shown here for, uh, for lack of space, um, but we also showed that on exercise, this resulted in a marked improvement in the rate of relaxation of the heart. But from a patient perspective, the key thing was that this improved exercise capacity. We measured exercise capacity using a technique called peak VO2. And there was a significant, a highly significant improvement in exercise capacity. And this was in, uh, associated with improvements in quality of life. So the drug was effective. Um, the difficulty is that perhexlene has very variable metabolism, that there are various genetic um, differences in the enzyme that metabolizes it, resulting in markedly different blood levels for the same dose. So in order to use this drug safely, 
you have to do blood levels and adjust them. So this is clearly an impediment to the widespread use of the drug. So how does IMB 101 work? Well, in many ways, in a very similar way. Uh, IMB 101, rather than preventing the uptake of fats into the mitochondria, actually prevents the oxidation of these fats. And by doing so, it reciprocally increases the use of glucose, shown by the thick blue line here. So the, there is an increased flux through this glucose oxidation pathway and a reduction in fatty acid oxidation. So IMB 101 is a partial inhibitor of the oxidation of fatty acids. That reciprocally shifts cardiac metabolism towards oxidation of glucose and increases the efficiency of generating ATP. And importantly, we know that the drug is well tolerated and it doesn't have the problems associated with pexlin or variable metabolism requiring drug levels and dose titration. So in summary, um, IMB 101 is an agent that alters the fuel that the heart uh, uses to generate energy. That results in, in, uh, results in an improved efficiency of energy generation. And therefore we are testing the hypothesis that that results in an improvement in energetics and an improvement in symptoms and exercise capacity. Thank you for your time. Okay, so we have a couple follow-up slides. Oops, where did Vanessa go? Vanessa disappeared. She dropped off, I see. Uh-oh, Vanessa, come back. Because I just got a note that she had some follow-up slides for us. Yeah, we, um, so we have a follow-up slide uh, that actually uh, names the centers where the clinical study is um, being conducted uh, here in the US and in the UK. I can share my screen to show that. That would be slide. perfectly fine, yeah. yeah. So I just rolled over my air buds, which by the way, I had in backwards almost all day and I was wondering why they were so annoying. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So um, we're, uh, Arash and I uh, are happy to answer any questions. Um, uh, I should have introduced Arash uh, properly in the beginning, a little rush there, apologies, but Arash is our chief scientific officer, <clears throat> a physician with a tremendous amount of experience um, in HCM uh, based at Oxford University in the UK. So I, I would defer any technical questions to Arash, but. I can speak to this. Um, this is our clinical study. Um, uh, here's the title uh, on the top. It's a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study studying our drug in patients with non-obstructive HCM. And here, um, basically, we have a geographic distribution of the site amongst the US. So we're at Tufts Medical Center in Boston. The other corner, Oregon Health and Science in Portland. Then we have Sanger Heart in Charlotte, North Carolina, University of California in San Francisco. Then in the middle of the country, um, Washington University in St. Louis, and then Northwestern um, outside of Chicago. And then to sort of both sides of the Atlantic, NYU in New York City and Oxford University in Oxford, UK. And I believe um, I saw a posting of a, uh, if you're interested in the study, potentially participating, there's a survey monkey survey that I know at the end of the survey, already you can actually pick or choose uh, these sites um, by uh, uh, what is closest to you or what is the most convenient for you to travel to. And um, we're, we're quite supportive of getting folks to sites in any way possible. So that, that's, that's where we are and yeah. <clears throat> okay, so there was a couple of questions. How do I know how to get in touch or how to, can I engage? So Ross has dropped the link in the chat as well as the Facebook feed. There's a link to the, um, to the trial survey which basically tells you a little bit about the inclusion and exclusion criteria, and then gives HCMA the permission to forward your contact information to the appropriate site coordinator. So um, we're still milling through some of those. Um, if you answered a couple weeks ago, um, if we haven't gotten back to you yet, by all means answer again, and we will get that running again. There was a little glitch in some of that. 
So we apologize if we didn't get back to you quickly enough, but we are very interested if you're very interested. So please do the survey. Um, okay. Uh, so I'm looking at any other questions. Um, the questions are kind of more housekeeping. If you're joining us after like, we've already been broadcasting for like four hours now, five hours, maybe I'm tired. Um, this will all be rebroadcast on our YouTube channel coming up soon. So if you've missed something, if you wanna hear something again, it's not your only chance. You will be able to see it again. Uh, so don't worry about missing anything. And we will be putting different segments up on the, on our website as well. So if anybody has any additional questions for Embria, now would be the time. Um, anybody wanna say anything else? Arash, you were a little quiet today. You wanna to say hi? Welcome to HCM Awareness Day. You're on mute. Thank you again for inviting me today, Lisa. It's, it's, it's great to be on. I think I saw a couple of questions. I think there was a, a thoughtful question around diet. I'm not sure whether that was in the Q&A or in the chat or. So there was a question much earlier on in the process about, is there any diet and lifestyle changes that one could recommend to improve quality of life with HCM? Um, so did, if you wanted to talk on that, you're more than welcome to. Yeah, I didn't know whether that related to the mechanism of action of the drug. So perhaps it's worth me just sort of summarizing that. So Professor Freno has uh, articulated it beautifully, but at a high level, effectively, you know, the way to characterize the heart is a, a very powerful engine, you know, that one demands a lot of, whether it's at rest uh, or with exercise. So as Michael said, you know, at rest, typically a normal cardiac output, so the amount of blood that is pumped out per minute um, is of the order of five liters. So five liters per minute. Um, with exercise, you know, good level exercise, one could get that uh, several fold increase, so potentially up to around 20 liters per minute. So that demands quite a lot of the engine. And the way the heart works is it can actually utilize the energy that's around, the fuel that's around, in other words. And there are multiple types of fuel, but the heart tends to prefer sugars, so what we call glucose from a medical perspective, um, or fats, and again, what we call medically fatty acids, long chain fatty acids. Uh, and a healthy heart can usually switch between the two. And what the drug does is really it biases the heart metabolism more towards glucose, which is really very, very efficient. And, and to give you again another sense of things, uh, in embryo, that's what the embryo prefers to use as well. So it, it tends to use glucose. Uh, and again, during periods of exertion and physical activity, glucose is the preferred fuel source. So what we've known for a very long time, partly through studies uh, done in Oxford, actually, so with colleagues here, and you can see we had Oxford as a recruitment center, is that there's something really very fundamental about HCM mutations in particular. So these sarcomeric mutations. So what we know from uh, specific studies using cardiac imaging is actually the energy levels within the heart are reduced, you know, as Michael outlined, uh, even before the onset of hypertrophy. So for example, if you have an individual who has a known uh, genotype positive, so carries a, a known recognized pathogenic mutation, uh, and yet, for example, on their echo scan or their uh, cardiovascular magnetic resonance, they don't have any thickening of the heart muscle yet. You still find significant reduction in the heart's energy level. And, and we think really over time, what the community thinks is that speaks to a primary role, you know, oh. an initial role of energy deficiency in driving some of the manifestations of HCM. So really what this drug is aiming to do is to improve the energy levels of the heart with a view to actually improving the performance of the heart and therefore hopefully ameliorating symptoms and really the initial plan and study the ongoing study is in the non-obstructive hcm form um really seeing whether we can improve that energy performance uh, of the heart and ultimately hopefully progress this as a therapy to you know to treat symptoms of exercise intolerance and breathlessness that some of the patients describe i think you bring up an excellent point and that is is the heart thick because it beats wrong or does it beat wrong because it's thick and if we get back to like where are we starting from that's actually a very interesting way to think about where we should be going, in my opinion. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great point, Lisa. Uh, I mean, obviously, for the purposes of where we are with Imbra, this is an early stage investigational therapy. So we, we have to really focus on patients who've got definitive diagnosis of Hocum, who've got the phenotypes, I mean, they've got the heart muscle thickening. Um, you know, there are preclinical studies. So these are sort of, you know, before one tests in humans in various, for example, rodent models of cardiomyopathy that have been published from a variety of labs in Europe and in the US that show that there is potentially the 
uh, ability to impact on the progression or even potentially the development of the phenotype. So what we know is if we start with, you know, the genetic mutation, it starts with what one would think is something very simple, which is kind of a, a simple, if you like, spelling error within that fundamental contractile unit of the sacrament. Not everyone has that, but the subsequent uh, events uh, are at least in part, we think, driven by energy deficiency. So I think probably there's a chicken and egg uh, situation here, but actually some of it is probably driven by the hypertrophy. So to give you another example, you, you, you can imagine actually that as the heart muscle thickens uh, in HCM, one of the things that we know about is actually that blood supply to the heart muscle. So the distance that oxygen has to travel from the blood vessel to reach the target muscle cells increases actually. So in other words, put another way, the density of blood supply, what we call the vasculature, does not necessarily increase in tandem with increase in musculature. And that is potentially one of the drivers of what we call ischemia or chest pain that can occur in patients with, uh, um, uh, with HCM. And as Michael described, in some parts of the world, it's not the easiest drug to use, uh, but people have used this medication called perhexylin, which acts in a similar way to IMB-101 um, for exactly those sorts of symptoms, for symptoms of chest pain or ischemia that are driven in part by the hypertrophy and, and what we call this sort of this um, uh, impairment of, of sort of blood supply to the muscle cells, actually. So that's perhaps an example of where the hypertrophy uh, can itself drive symptoms uh, in the non-obstructive form of HCM. We do have a question regarding trial participation. I don't know if you want to address it or not. Um, is there any exclusion criteria to somebody being 100% paced? Yeah, so happy, happy to take that. And then perhaps Paul, Paul can also comment. So I don't believe there are any specific hard exclusion criteria. I think we've kind of provided a link uh, around pacing. Um, probably not applicable to the questioner, but within the UK, individuals who have a uh, MRI incompatible pacemaker, um, that, that is a sort of a relative, if you like, exclusion criteria, because we're looking to do MRI studies in the UK as well, uh, looking at the energy levels, but not specifically. But what I would encourage that individual to do is obviously to, to reach out via the link uh, and obviously to discuss it with the local site and, and assess their specific suitability. And if there are any specific questions to also ask their um, uh, ask their responsible physician as well. Um, what is required as part of the study, really what we're aiming to do is a fairly big ask. We're looking to see whether the drug increases the energy levels in the heart. Incredible, right? Actually, so without a heart biopsy, we can do this with a high-end form of um, cardiac imaging. So similar to MRI, it's magnetic resonance based, but we call it, uh, the acronym is MRS, so MR spectroscopy. And it gives you that number that Michael was describing, which is that PCR to ATP ratio. So we can look a baseline at the end and see whether we've improved the energy levels. You know, is the drug doing what we think it should do? Um, secondly, and very, very critically, we would basically, we are asking um, uh, interested individuals who uh, are suitable for a study and who provide informed consent to undertake a high level, what we call exercise test, which is a cardiopulmonary exercise test. Um, and Lisa, very much along the lines of what you described earlier in terms of um, uh, potential individuals who might be eligible for sort of advanced HCM therapy. So for example, potentially transplantation, CPET is what we call it, uh, is a very uh, robust and recognized test that gives you a lot of information about whether you've improved the, the, the heart as a kind of a mechanical engine, really, have you improved that performance? Um, so that would really be the key question for the, for the individual who's raised the thoughtful question. Fantastic. Well, gentlemen, it's HCM Awareness Day and this train is moving. We really appreciate you spending some time with us today. We're sorry we lost Vanessa. Please send her our regards. Thank you to the entire team at Embrya for caring about HCM and being interested in doing a clinical trial. And to the community, as I mentioned earlier, it takes us all to learn. So please consider participating in a clinical trial. The link is in the chat and in the Facebook feed, and you can also find it on the HCMA website. Gentlemen, thank you so much. And Vanessa, who's not here anymore, and Michael Furneaux for coming in on video. So thank you so much. And I'm going to pivot now to Dr. Harry Lever. Happy thank HCMA you. day, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you, Brian. Okay, Harry, do I have you here? You're on mute. Hello, Harry, and happy Hi. HCM Awareness Day. Hi. I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about something that is really important to all of us. And you've spent a great deal of time focusing on, for those who are not aware who Harry Lever is, Dr. Harry Lever 
practiced at the Cleveland Clinic for 40 something years. And I've been happy to call him my friend for 26 years. He was one of the first people I met in HCM clinical care and has taken care of thousands of HCMA members over the years. Um, Harry, genetic, generic, sorry, generic medications. We have a problem with quality in this country. I, I should have gotten this talk pitched earlier, but can you give us a few minute answer on what the quality problems are and how patients can check their bottles to make sure they're getting a good manufacturer? Well, the problem is that about 80, eight, about 80, 80 to 90 percent of the active ingredients are coming from China. And for the finished drugs, about 40 to 50 percent are coming from India. And in, for some drugs, it may even be more than that. And we've come to recognize that some drugs just don't seem to work when uh, people all of a sudden they're doing well and and then, then, then they, something happens. And it turns out that what's going on is that as time has gone on, more drugs are coming from overseas. And the pharmacies, because the, there's a, there was a law that was passed by the government called the Hatch-Waxman Act back in 1984, all they had to do was test about uh, 24 or 30 normal volunteers. And if the, if, the, the, if, if the levels of the drug fell between 80 and 125% of the name of the brand drug, then they could say they were the same. Well, as time has gone on, it's gotten worse than that. And we've come to realize that, that pharmacies are changing manufacturers and not telling the patient. And worse than that, the doctors don't know it's being changed because, oh, everything is the same, but it's not the same. And so one of the things that we have found in, that I tell patients is that if all of a sudden you're not feeling well, something has, you haven't done anything different, and all of a sudden you're not feeling well, then you have to, then you need to check about who the manufacturer is on, and whether it was, whether the pharmacy changed that manufacturer on you. If you, in other words, if you, everything, something was working fine uh, and all of a sudden it isn't, then you got to track, check and see if the manufacturer has been changed. And you got to tell the pharmacy you don't want to change the manufacturer. Sometimes that's difficult because they don't want to be bothered with that. But the fact is we have found, particularly with metoprolol succinate that we use a lot in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that uh, there are certain brands coming from India that just don't seem to work well. And uh, one company in particular has had a lot of violations against them. And we tell patients not to use that. And we, well, there's an authorized generic, which means that it's made by the original company with the original formula. That one is okay. And that one is made by New American Therapeutics. So that's the one that we were trying to get. It's originally made by AstraZeneca. And that's what we want to, if the patients are getting into trouble and things don't seem right to get it switched to that. I'm going to pivot for just a quick second on a non-HCM drug, but a transplant drug, one that I am on. It's tacrolimus. Right. And it's the thing that is between me and rejecting my heart. I take it every 12 hours, every day for the rest of my life. Can't skip this one. So because Harry has beat this into my head that name brands and generics aren't the same and generics can be different and titration levels are different and dilution rates are different. All of these things can vary. Anytime that I was getting my transplant meds and the manufacturer would change, I would make sure that I had blood work done within two weeks. And I did this for three and a half years, maybe. And then one day, uh, my tacrolimus that I had been getting through a company called um, Ascend, I think it was Ascend, um, it changed to Sandoz. I'm a Jersey girl. Novartis and Sandoz is right down the street from our office. So a name I knew, but it was different. And little did I know it was not manufactured where I thought it would be manufactured. Um, and my tacrolimus levels were below therapeutic for the first time since my transplant. I had maintained stable for three and a half years on one brand. They changed me to another and I was in danger of rejection. 
if I had not known to go check, I could have gone a whole quarter until my pills were refilled on this drug that was not effective for me. It might be fine for somebody else because that's what they were dosed on, but you can't change certain things. So I encourage you all, if you start to feel a little bit different and you don't know why, check your manufacturer first, make sure that there's consistency. If you're not sure, you can go back and ask the pharmacy where it was filled, who was my manufacturer then, who is it now? Or you can check on your pill bottle It's in various places, but it's by law required to be on a pill bottle in the United States. So I encourage you all to- Not, so, not all the time. Sometimes they don't put the manufacturer. Well, by law, they're supposed to put the manufacturer. Well, some pharmacies haven't always done that. And, and what you need to do is you look at the, you go to a, there's a program called drugs.com. And there's a, in that program is a pill identifier. And you look at the tablet and there's a number on the tablet. You enter the number in the picture and, and, and it'll tell you who the manufacturer is. So we have a question. Is there a listing of who is unreliable? It's a, that's a tricky question. That's um, a tricky question. We, we are working, Harry is working very diligently with um, another organization that's trying to come up with a way to communicate this better. Right. Um, your best way to do it right now is to, you know, call into the office and ask if there's, if you're noticing any problems. We have a small list here, but, you know, right. we need to be careful that not all generics right. are bad. We don't want right. to blanket say a company is bad, but there are some bad actors. And Dr. Reddy has a lot of violations with the FDA. So I would just stay immediately away from anything Dr. Reddy. I won't even take their, their migraine medication. Um, so just be careful where you're getting things from, know where they're coming from as best you can. And if you need some help, you can give us a call at the office. Harry, I could stay and talk to you all day like I do on a Sorry. podcast, but I got to pivot on to my next That's conversation. Thank you so much for being a surprise guest here today. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. So that was an added treat. I'm very happy that he was able to join us for a little bit. And I, I keep looking over at my cheat sheet to see what I'm doing next, but I get a little bit of time to talk to you about some services of the HCMA. And hopefully we are at, coming into the six o'clock hour. I'm a little bit behind there, but I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint and walk you through some of the services of the HCMA and some of the projects that we're working on um, that you can learn more about. So, Ready? At least I can take a breath. Okay, everybody take a breath, take a stretch. It's been a long day, hasn't it? Okay. My dinner's waiting outside the door. So in a little bit, I'm going to take bites in between talking. So um, this is not as populated as it should be because we have some other efforts coming on and some things got dropped off my slide. Um, everybody else's slides are perfect. My own are probably not as well. So the HCMA knows that we need to do more work on an international basis. And there are very few organizations worldwide that focus on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient advocacy. So we have been working with different organizations, a wonderful group out of the Netherlands, uh, a group that's starting out out of Sweden. We have um, friends in Italy that are working on patient advocacy. And the HCMA also belongs to something called the Global Heart Hub, where we will be coming up with global messaging on not only hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but heart failure. So we've got a lot of initiatives going on there. We've recently spoken to, I don't know where this, the rest of my slide went. We've spoken to, um, we're bringing the center of excellence concept out of the country. Canada is coming on board with us shortly. Um, we have patient advocacy efforts in Australia getting organized in, in a new way. We're working with Japan. I have a meeting in two weeks to talk to them about getting that organized. And I'm hoping to get into South America as well and get some Spanish speaking um, language uh, materials created. We co-brand our posters in the language that is native and we link their Facebook communication page to the HCMA for the extra bandwidth that we have to kind of monitor that for them. And we're training up mini leases, if you will, around the country, around the world. So I encourage you to stay in touch with HCMAI and see what we're doing to help the world. If you have not already participated in, witnessed, been part of, been a faculty member in one of our Big Hearted Warrior tours, I encourage you to go to our calendar of events and look for the next coming up event. Um, I think, who are we doing next? I think we're doing Orlando next. We just did Iowa a couple of weeks ago. Uh, maybe it's St. Thomas coming up. St. Thomas is coming up in, from Nashville. Um, these are these about two and a half hour sessions 
where three or four, sometimes five speakers from a center will come forward with their view on HCM, studies that they're doing, their perspective on management. And you get to hear from all of these different thought leaders in all of these different centers. It's a wonderful program. And we are very grateful to the funders of this uh, project, which include um, Invite, Boston Scientific, um, Bristol Myers Squibb and Cytokinetics, and that funding helps that educational process continue. So thank you for your support there. Tales from the Heart, a podcast from the HCMA. Does that sound familiar to anybody? So if you are a podcaster, we have over 40 episodes now. And of course, we can't, we can't go backwards. We got to go forward. And every Friday this year, all right, I might I might miss a few because I might go on vacation and it might not work that day. Um, But every Friday we have scheduled either um, a medical professional. Um, Once a month I meet with Marty Marin in in, in Tales from the Heart. And every other month I either meet with Steve Amon or Harry Lever. Steve Amon's first session is coming up this weekend or this Friday. Very excited about that. Um, And then on the alternating weeks, we will bring you a story from an HCM warrior. Somebody from industry might come and speak to us. We may do a deep dive in education with one of our partners. There's always content and it's inspiring, educational. All right, we have a little bit of fun too, because, you know, HCM is really serious. And sometimes you just got to laugh and and find the absurdity in, in life. And we do that a little bit too. So Come get to know us a little bit better. Come have conversations with us. We do stream our our podcasting live so we can take live questions. Um, So it's streamed on Facebook. It's recorded. It's uploaded into the blogosphere and then the the podcastosphere, if that's a word. And I encourage you to listen. And by the way, that image, see see my neon behind me? That image sparked the wall behind me that got done at Christmas time. So trying to be a little, you know, a little trendy here. Okay, so this is the slide that I didn't get to finish. If you become a member of the HCMA, we have now created an HCM journal. This is like a real thing. I have one here. I'll go grab one when I take a little break later and I come back to camera. This journal is an opportunity for our members to track their symptoms, know how to communicate with which family members, how to understand your measurements and your your gradients and what is progressing. What are high risk features for cardiac arrest? What are your symptoms? What are your triggers? You can keep it all in a journal. And we recommend one for each member of the family who has HCM clinically or genetically. And this allows you to kind of track your journey with HCM. We have a lot of them because I like buying in bulk and I got a really good deal, which then came on a pallet and we're on a third floor walk up. So I didn't plan that part very well. So we have lots of them here in house. So please take them. Um, We did, uh, we did have the opportunity thanks to a very lucrative um, giving Tuesday last November, we were able to send a bunch of kits out to each one of our center of excellence partners, along with a scholarship membership for five individuals to become members of the HCMA. We always seem to have scholarship memberships around because people see the value in membership and the time it gets you on the phone and the support uh, materials you get. You also get the book from Dr. Marin and myself on HCM and a bunch of other materials in membership. But you should never be afraid that, well, I can't afford that. We always have space. And even if we don't, we do. We find the way. So if the community helps support, it's been amazing on what we're able to do. So become a member, get a journal. Okay, HCM Academy. Again, I have to give a big shout out to the sponsors of HCM Academy, which are Sanofi, um, Cytokinetics, and Bristol Myers Squibb. This is a what I call a spoke education model, where we have our faculty who help develop the curriculum, and then we have regional teachers or educators. Dr. Harry Lever is one of them. Uh, John Szymanski is one. I, I can't think of any others off the top of my head right now. But there is an opportunity for individuals to do online learning so they can go do the modules for HCM Academy. And when they do those modules for HCM Academy, they are going to take a pre-learning assessment. They're going to go through the online modules. And then they have this unique opportunity to meet with an HCM specialist in a discussion type education environment that are small. It's eight, 10, 12 people at a time 
meeting with an expert and they can ask questions and they can take a deeper dive at their convenience from the comfort of their home. And we are really hoping to hit a lot of people with this education. It explains the importance of center of excellence care. And we really wanna treat this as an educational opportunity for community cardiologists, community physicians at any level to get a better understanding of HCM. If you become a member, we will send you these cards which have a QR code that take you right to HCM Academy page. You can go to our website if you're a patient and you wanna sign your doctor up. All I need is an address, hopefully an email address, and we can invite them to HCM Academy. If you're a physician, you can go directly to I'm a physician and sign up for HCM Academy and you can schedule your date for, for learning. Uh, so we really encourage you to do this. If we do not improve base knowledge of HCM for clinicians, we will never solve the problem because we will never get those referrals upstream. So let's all participate. Let's spread this far and wide and let's make sure everybody understands the basics of HCM. Okay, part of HCM, part of the HCM Academy, I'm like, wait, it's coming up next. This looks blank. I forgot to put a frame on it. Um, there are a number of patient stories that are also featured in this learning module. And I am going to black myself off and there's just a couple of minutes of videos that are just snippets from four of the amazing HCM warriors that were featured as patient stories and, and clinical evaluation stories within HCM Academy. So without further ado, I give you, I believe Marsha starts us off. I knew that I had some very serious medical situations, but the local doctors in our hometown really knew very little about the condition. When they realized that I had an issue, they immediately sent me to a hospital in Washington where I had an alcohol ablation. I came home and I immediately knew I was absolutely no better. Went back to the same doctors and less than six months later, sent me back to the same hospital where they did a second alcohol ablation. Again, I was no better. I wish, oh my goodness, do I wish I had only and initially had the ablation. Because for me, the alcohol septal ablations completely ruined my electrical system. And now I am 100% pacemaker dependent. My heart only beats twice a minute on its own. Everything else is 100% because of the pacemaker. It's a little scary sometimes because you know I've had washing machines fail and <laughs> I don't want anything else to fail. It's a little more personal. I love Marsha. She's adorable. And next, I believe we have Joseph or Willie. Let's see. I think it's Willie. After going through Willie. the HCM journey with my brother and then finding out that I have HCM, Dr. Marin sat down with me and we talked about my kids and that he needed to be screened, only to have to tell him that not only do I have kids, but my kids are athletes, which makes it even more difficult to screen but also my kids are Olympic caliber athletes, which brings up a whole nother ball of wax in that because they're such athletes, it's harder to tell if they have HCM because their hearts are enlarged to start with. And that in order to test them and screen them, they would have to stop what they were doing. I also found out after my transplant that two of my older brothers have recently been diagnosed with the same condition. So it's hereditary. It's important that you get screened, but people need to understand that it is hereditary. And unfortunately, there is no way of avoiding it and there's no way of really reversing it. You just have to understand you have it and manage the symptoms, but also prepare for the inevitable. I think it's an important pause moment here to acknowledge not only is Willie, his brother Russell was a client of the HCMA as well. Unfortunately, he did not make it past his transplant by much. He had complications. Um, Willie then went on to have a transplant. He's doing very well. And I am really proud to tell you that this summer in the Olympics, his daughter won a gold medal. 
So when he says Olympic level athletes, he's not exaggerating. She's not only Olympic level, she set world records in her track and field event. So congratulations to the entire family on that accomplishment. So the next story is Joseph's. This one makes me cry. He's one of my Jersey boys. Um, it's an amazing story. I met him at a community event where I was going to talk only about transplant. And I had to bring up my HCM story because that's what led me to transplant. And it turned out that he had been mismanaged and misdiagnosed for many years. And he knew he had HCM finally, and things were getting a little out of control. And here's, here's how it's impacted him. So now that I had this condition and been living with it for so long, I was filled with a lot of guilt um, that I was holding back my family. And, and we made a conscious effort. Like I said to my wife, let's plan vacations, let's do it. And I'll give you my best. But if I have to sit and watch or maybe not leave the hotel that day. So we did, we planned around it. But again, I assure you that I was never 100% there, not even close. My wife questioned me and said, you know, you can't do the things you did last year. Just to give you an example. I mean, there were so many instances of that, going on vacation, going to Disney World. I couldn't do the things I wanted to do with the family. I was pretty certain I was never going to reach 50 or 55. And I was, I was trying, I, I would think about that a lot when making plans. And, and then when I got to 50 and 55, I really, I really believe that I wasn't going to be on this earth much longer. And I thought about it constantly. And I would get sad. I would think about it privately when I was alone. It would dominate my thoughts. I would think about my children and their future. And I knew that I wouldn't be there to see grandkids or watch them grow up ever, or even see my daughters get married. The sadness was... I, I really had come to terms with this illness. And, you know, when you're living it for so long, like I did, I accepted it. I really did. And at the end, I said, you know, I, I hope I'm not a burden to anyone. And the only sadness that I felt was the sadness that I knew my daughters would feel. And I was sad that I didn't want to make them sad in their lives by me not being here anymore. I was trying to figure out how I could do something that they wouldn't, they wouldn't miss me or wouldn't be sad. I felt frail and weak as a 50 year old man. I felt as if I was 80 years old. And honestly, I just thought I was putting in days. There's nothing we can do to help you. I just broke down and cried. And I went home and I, I told my wife, I said, I really, I have to have a serious conversation with you. I'm in big trouble. It doesn't look good. I mean, he has me scheduled in two weeks to have this defibrillator put in. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't think I have much longer. When Dr. Martinez uh, defined it, identified it, diagnosed it, it was like a validation. I mean, like I, I, I said this again and again, I broke down and cried. I cried so uncontrollably. And my wife said, it's good. It's happy. I, it was so many thoughts. It was a validation that I wasn't nuts. That this is why I can't do these things. This is, this is why I can't walk with my wife holding hands on the boardwalk. Okay. This is why I, I can't go on vacation with my family. It was a validation, I guess, of that. This is why I, I had suffered so long, you know? So... That's, that was a real hardship, first of all, not being diagnosed properly. And this is what I tell people in my life when they're uh, faced with any illness. I just say the proper diagnosis, meeting the proper people, the people that are skilled in that specific area, you have to get in front of those people because having the proper diagnosis means everything. You need to go watch the rest of Joseph's story in HCM Academy. He will make you cry. I got to put the raw footage up someday. It, his story is absolutely unbelievable. I have one more story and then we're going to bring in a guest. So the stories that you've seen today 
are the gamut of the age group. And now we're going to hear from a young lady who was diagnosed at birth. Having this heart disease that lasts your lifetime, you know, there is not the only cure for it is getting a heart transplant. Um, that it does have a lot of mental health effects as well that can you know, be very, very difficult to live with. The surgeries growing up and with the entire experience that has caused a lot of mental health problems. I, it didn't really hit me until I was in my early years of high school that I was like, oh, this is, you know, a big issue. And I didn't really take care of it until I was in college. It gave me a lot of pretty severe anxiety and, you know, having HCM and having anxiety, I am prone to panic attacks, which is a really, really bad thing while having a heart disease because when I'm in the middle of a panic attack, I can't breathe. I'm hyperventilating. My heart is racing, which is not what we want for, for HCM. Trying to find those, those um, tactics that do help with that. So my heart doesn't have as much strain. And it's, it's actually been pretty interesting that I've had some ICD checks and I've had, um, you know, when I, when I go get it ch uh, checked by the company, they'll look at it and be like, oh, you had a little, your ICD did something here on this day. Do you know if anything that might've happened? And, you know, I kind of have to look back and I'm like, Oh, this bad thing happened. I was having a panic attack. So that is a snippet of some of our, oh, I'm going to stop sharing there. That's coming up next. So Amit, come on onto screen with me. I am now being joined by HCMA, chairman of the board, Dr. Amit Kalia, who came sliding in from work <laughs> after his day as an interventional radiologist and now is going to put on his chairman's hat. Well, thanks Amit. so much for having me. I appreciate it. We're almost through the day. I've yeah. literally been sitting in this chair all day talking all things HCM. <laughs> it's been well, great. It, it, what I've seen has been fantastic. I mean, what a, what, a wonderful, uh, what a wonderful thing you put together tonight. I just want to say good evening to everybody. Uh, as Lisa said, my name is Ahmed Kali. I'm the president of the board of directors of the HCMA. I appreciate you giving me a couple minutes of your time to uh, to say a couple things about what the HCMA has been doing, what the board has been doing, and how we're trying to serve you. So if you're here, you likely have some idea of what the HCMA has been doing on behalf of patients and families since its inception in 1996. It's incredible to, to think about that, Lisa. I mean, 96. Yeah, it was two. <laughs> <laughs> I was a child prodigy. Yes. Yes. So with the support of patients, families, corporate and individual donors, the HCMA is, has been able to expand its focus. Um, and it, it really has exploded in the past couple of years. Uh, awareness, of course, always uh, will be a cornerstone of what the HCM, HCMA does, uh, getting patients to diagnosis, as we saw on the, on the previous video, and spreading the word about the disease and helping families cope with um, and understanding devastating losses is, is really at the core of what the HCMA does. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the next steps. I mean, um, the next ambitious step is making sure that good quality care is accessible and recognized. And that's why the centers of excellence are such a vital part of, of today's talks. The other key initiatives I'd like to emphasize, um, the next big steps are moving us closer to effective therapies for, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Then there's legislative advocacy. It's one of the uh, committees tasked with ensuring voices are heard in state capitals and in Washington. Um, the, the next effort I want to touch on is patient education. It's another effort that's been really a cornerstone, really a part of the HCMA since its beginning. Uh, it's grown and evolved with the advent of social media and online sharing of information. And having a trusted source has, has really shown to be vital for patients. Uh, as we see that there are often conflicting sources of medical information. So having one place you can go and know that that information is trustworthy is, uh, is really uh, crucial. The next big, big effort that's underway uh, is sifting through the voluminous data uh, to provide meaningful medical research to help clinicians, institutions, and, and even our uh, uh, industry partners understand what the medical and social issues are that our patients encounter. So I hope you leave today with an appreciation for the magnitude of effort uh, that is being put forth to provide patients, families uh, with care and support they deserve. And that's by the clinicians, uh, by the institutions, and by the experts that you're hearing today.
So as always, I encourage you to be part of the effort any way you can, if that means volunteering your time, uh, being on the news group, uh, and of course, remembering the HCMA when you donate to your favorite nonprofit. Um, that would be fantastic. Again, thanks so much. I appreciate you giving me a couple minutes, Lisa, to, to chat. Of course, we had to drag you in today. I know you're really busy, <laughs> but why don't you stay with, with us when I show them the next slide, which I kind of yeah. already showed them, but I'll go back and show them again. And then we're going to take a break from Facebook in a few minutes. But um, one of the exciting projects that I was able to work on in the past couple of years um, was finally partnering with the American Heart Association. We have some amazing partners now, but one of the things that was a little bit daunting starting a small nonprofit is, you know, what's the big nonprofit for heart, American Heart Association. And they finally came to the table and said, hey, we want you to help us educate people on HCM seeing as you guys know this so well. So for those who have been around a while, they will recognize the concept of this poster as being one that was crowdsourced. We developed this in our Facebook community. What do you want to know as a patient? And we helped the patients actually develop what they wish they had when they were diagnosed. So we came up with this format, similar. Um, it went through American Heart Association, scientific and branding. So we changed it up a little bit to be a little bit more consistent with both of the brands. We have the, these are the rack cards with ha that have your checklist on them. Some of them have the heart up front. Some of them have a family up front so they can be used in different places. But imagine that the little kitchen table startup has co-branded materials with the American Heart Association. So you can download these elements now or at any time. They are now on the website and we're really happy to be partnering not only with American Heart, but we have some other partners coming up tonight. Um, and we really appreciate them seeing the value in patient driven education of a scientific nature that is accurate and informative. So yay partnership. This is this is just a fantastic example of of you know what the HCMA has been doing, what you've been doing all these years. If folks haven't already taken a great look at this, I I really implore you to do that. I mean, the information is is incredibly concise. It really, in a nutshell, talks about uh, sort of the phases phases of the disease, um, what is being done to treat. I mean, the amount of information um, that I, I can tell you. Uh, patients and families have, have told us that if they had this early on, it would just be such a game changer. So please, if you haven't already, take a look at this um, and, and read it. Uh, it's really important. Fantastic. And you can download it. You can print it locally. You can distribute it to your doctor's offices. You can do whatever you want with it. It's out there. Go use it. It'd be awesome. Um, so while I have the chair of the board here, I want to take a moment to acknowledge people. You've heard a lot of Lisa today. Lisa can only do what Lisa does because I have an army behind me and helping and seeing the vision. Okay. Sometimes I come up with wacky ideas to save the world, but y'all just got to stick with me. They all end up working out in the end. So yes, I'm founder and CEO and member of the board, but I'm at his chair. And thank you to Susan and Biller and Gordon and Carlton and Robert and Marty and Richard and Lynn, who's now emeritus, and Isaac and Adam and Steve Winters. Steve, Adam, Lynn have been there since founding. They have given 26 years of service to the HCMA. Um, we have some potential new board members coming on maybe soon. We'll see what happens there. Um, we've got a couple spaces open. And we have to give a shout out to the amazing staff. Um, and they're in no particular order because I just kind of threw them on here. So don't anybody get funny about who's in one year. You wouldn't do that. Ross Hadley, who has been with us almost a year as our project manager. Stacy's come on last November as our center of excellence coordinator. Amy, who is our meeting and HCM Academy coordinator. Sabrina does our intakes. Julie is our volunteer coordinator. Carolyn has been with the HCMA for, I think it's 16 years now. Um, it's crazy how long it's been. And she's our membership coordinator and manages the database as well. Julie Olson is an event coordinator. If you want to have an event and a fundraiser for the HCMA, we have a coordinator we can lend to you to help you organize that event. Nikki is our intern extraordinaire who we've taken from her sophomore year of high school into her sophomore year of medical school. 
and she's been with us the whole time. I will build myself an HCM doctor and her name is Nikki. Just give me a couple more years and I'll be busting some of our centers to bring her in as, as, a, as a fellow. And Elena Morgan is our newest acquisition and very happy to have her on the team. Many members of the HCMA team are members of the tribe as well, which brings a really unique perspective. They don't only work it, they live it, they understand it, and they're here to serve you. And it's this group of individuals who are bringing you what you see on the front end. My face may be out there more often than others. That might be changing soon because I'm going to be behind the scenes and other people are going to be out front like our discussion group leaders and our volunteers. Uh, but there's just so much going on right now. And it's all good stuff. Um, and any comments before I let you run it's, away? It's fantastic. Okay. So, okay, boss, we doing good? Okay. We are going to stop here. I said a pause for a second. I am going to say... Thank you, to Amit, for joining. You can oh, you. move back Thanks off to, to uh, attending now. We're yeah. going to break from Facebook for just a few minutes. Thank you, Amit. Thank um, you. We're going to break from Facebook for a minute. Um, where did it go? Here's the Facebook. Facebook, we're going to be back on in 15 minutes with a new lead, and then we're going to start talking about advocacy. I'm going to take a few minutes here and give a little pause break. And thank you, Facebook. We'll be back.